Good morning, everyone. It's 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's the things that you need to know in your morning rundown. Put down those picket signs for now. The Writers Guild reached a tentative deal with studios, possibly ending one of Hollywood's longest labor disputes. Writers still need to vote on the agreement, and there's still a long road ahead before the industry is back up and running. Don't forbid, forget about those striking actors, of course. Plus, we've got less than a week until a potential government shutdown. House Republicans have just five days to resolve a spending stalemate. To secure the votes needed, Speaker McCarthy is stuck between striking a deal with Democrats or far-right members of his own party. TikTok. Yes, and Amazon is kicking its artificial intelligence investment into high gear. The tech giant announcing it will invest up to $4 billion in AI firm Anthropic. Now this is as it looks to keep up with rivals Microsoft and Google. All right, well, today's morning driver, a government shutdown looms with the deadline now less than a week away. President Biden and Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg ramping up calls for Republicans to come to a resolution ahead of Sunday, warning of impacts to military paychecks, airlines and public programs. But how is this going to impact stocks? Now, this would be the first shutdown since 2019, where the S&P 500 gained 13 percent during that 35 days stalemate. For more on this, we want to bring in Kevin Gordon, Charles Schwab, a senior investment strategist. Kevin, it's good to see you. So should we be using history as a guide if, in fact, we do see the government shut down, if they're not able to reach a deal by the end of the week? Are markets just going to shake that off? Um, you know, I think you have to keep in mind sort of the context that we've been in, which is, you know, a pretty weaker, a weakening breadth profile under the surface for the market. So I think, you know, if, as an investor, um, if you're looking at this purely from a market perspective and through that lens, you never want to use the shutdown um, as something that is going to drive the market in one direction or another. And, you know, you're just talking about the most recent one. If you look at that episode, late 2018 into ter early 2019, you know, that was a moment when we were coming off that near bear market low in December 2018, you had some pretty strong momentum carrying you through into 2019. So it was pretty hard to work against that current. And then almost conversely, if you go back to the shutdowns that we had in the 70s, you know, we were mired in a, in a secular bear market for stocks, but also fighting a stagflation issue. So I think the backdrop from an economic and a market perspective matters a lot more than, you know, sort of the short term driver of what the potential shutdown means for the economy from a pothole perspective, not necessarily an entire economic slowdown perspective. All that considered, though, Kevin, when you think about some of the areas of government that would be shut down, are there potential trades, portfolio positions that investors should consider in this type of environment and knowing that uh, there could be still much negotiation that needs to come forward even after a potential shutdown? Well, you know, I think the, the good news in this environment, and Brad, you and I have talked about this before, where you never want to be looking, at, especially from a sector perspective, you don't want to be thinking, you know, monolithically or traditionally in terms of what works defensively in an environment when things are slowing down or you're getting a weaker profile from the market. And, you know, case in point is since the peak at the end of July, for at least for the S&P 500, um, the only outperformer and the defensive area of the market has been energy. Um, and yeah, that's, I think, synonymous with what's going on with oil, but also the fact that energy scores pretty well from an interest coverage ratio perspective, meaning, you know, a lot of those companies have the money and have the funds available to pay off interest expense. That's not the case for the rest of the market, certainly not the case for some of the consumer staples areas, which you would typically consider defensive. So even under the defensive or traditional defensive sector umbrella, utilities look very different from staples. They're trading in different ways. Utilities doing a little bit better. Um, you know, now outperforming energy, but doing a little bit better than what would tra traditionally be considered safe from a staples perspective. So, Kevin, taking all that into account, then I guess when investors are trying to figure out when they should be more comfortable adding some of that risk back into their portfolio, what are some of the signs or some of the things that they need to be watching for? Well, I think improving breadth under the surface, because you're now at a point where um, a lot of what had started to look better from our perspective, June until July, somewhat into August, where participation was broadening out. You had seen it a little bit down the cap spectrum. You had seen it um, kind of equal weight versus you know cap weight S&P, but that started to unwind from August into September. And now, um, you know, the unfortunate part is whether you're looking at the percent of stocks above their 50 day moving average or above their 200 day moving average within the S&P, the NASDAQ or the Russell, all of those breadth statistics have started to break down. So it hasn't been the case 
which is what we were looking for, where some of the air is coming out of the mega cap names, you know, the leaders and the high flyer, flyers that were driving the market's gains this year. Um, it hasn't been the case where that air is going back into the rest of the market. It's kind of been this you know, broader scale breakdown uh, from, from a breadth point of view. So I think that if you get a stabilization there and you start to see the rest of the market do a little bit of heavy lifting, you get that lift from earnings and forward earnings expectations. And I would add, you get a lift from revenue expectations because that's kind of what was missing in the most recent earnings season. That, you know, those are sort of the ingredients that you need, I think, to, to kind of move out on the risk spectrum a little bit. But I think for now, you know, given the unique nature of this cycle, given the kind of non-confirmations along the way, you know, almost a year after a major market low, you're not seeing signs you would typically see in a strong or a durable bull market. You really just want to stay defensive in factor or characteristic terms, not necessarily like I was saying from a sector perspective, but moving up in quality, staying high in that quality you know, area, whether it's large cap versus small cap, whether it's high interest coverage versus low interest coverage, things of that nature. Kevin, even as I'm looking at the futures this morning here, and, and we're seeing some fractional declines across the U.S. major averages, it comes off of last week where some chop was reinitiated, and that really driven by the Fed's commentary and the markets really digesting what a more hawkish Fed might continue to mean in terms of their own rate, rate policy going forward from here. What type of overhang do you believe that that's going to be in Q4 as we kind of are basically in the last week and closing the books on Q3 now? Well, I think even beyond Q4, um, what you have to now keep in mind, and most recently Austin Goolsby was out this morning talking about this, is it's it's not the higher for longer, you know, the higher part of that. It's now the for longer. Um, and, you know, Jay Powell was kind of alluding to this where we now need to start considering whether they hike again or not in November. I'm not sure that's as much the focus as it is moving into next year and how long they stay at a restrictive level. You know, whether the right rate cuts that the, that the market's pricing in right now are correct in the sense that they're just going to be a little incremental and the Fed still keeps real rates elevated, or if we do have to turn around or if the Fed does have to turn around, start to pivot aggressively and cut rates. But that would be, you know, kind of for the wrong reasons economically. But I think, you know, the overarching theme of all of this is, as you mentioned, you have to start thinking about what are the knock-on effects from what they've already done? And then what do we start to see as they keep rates restrictive? Because you're just getting to that restrictive level now, as the Fed believes. And you still need to see key parts of inflation that they're tracking roll over. Um, you know, you could look at just core goods versus core services inflation, and you know, most of the disinflation progress so far has been in the former. And that's the supply chain unwind. That's kind of the pandemic unwind from all the stress that we had in the bottleneck. Um, so as that's kind of been alleviated, now you have to shift your attention to services and then any connection that that has with the labor market. So you know, any tightness you see in labor, any you know, potential unwind there. Yeah, that probably alleviates some of the inflation pressure, but is the expense, um, you know, sort of on the economic side where you start to see spending slow down and then that tips you into more of a slowdown or a recessionary environment. Too soon to tell what the, you know, what that's going to look like. But I think you have to keep that dynamic in mind, especially now that we're getting closer to the end of the tightening cycle than we are at the beginning. Yeah, and Kevin, given that, I'm curious, what's your base case just in terms of what we're going to see from Fed policy and then the odds or the possibility of a recession? Are you still confident that we are going to be able to avoid a recession and go back to more of that soft landing scenario? Well, you know, one of our, our thesis has been for the past year and a half that the economy has been suffering from some form of recession. Uh, it's just been rolling in nature where it started on the goods and the manufacturing side. Um, in housing, particular last year, housing definitely went through its own recession. Some parts of the housing market are still in recession, but some of those indicators have started to turn up a little bit, whether it's home builder sentiment, although we've had a little bit of a rollover in the past couple of months, um, but you haven't had any recessionary like readings within the services part of the economy or within the labor market. So you've had that nice offset of strength in services and labor where you've had you know, significant weakness and deterioration within manufacturing and goods. So if you can continue to see the roll through of the recession where you start to get some rolling recoveries in manufacturing and in goods, but then you start to see a little bit of a slowdown in services and labor, you know, that in our mind, that's best case scenario. But if you do start to see some of these rolling recoveries stunted a bit, and then you also get no, you know, you don't have an offset anymore from services or labor, then that probably puts the economy into what is more, you know, considered more of a traditional recession. So again, you know, probably the most unique cycle we've ever seen. That makes it kind of tougher to call. But the, the biggest piece to all of this is labor, because if you slow that down enough, you sort of cut the spending power that consumers have had now that you have this kind of savings cushion um, that has, you know, wound down pretty much not to nothing, but, you know, getting closer to that point. 
um, that's probably the most important dynamic to consider right now, especially as it pertains to Fed policy, too. Kevin Gordon, Charles Schwab, senior investment strategist. Kevin, always a pleasure to get your insights here. Thanks for kicking Thanks, off guys. the week with us. Appreciate Thanks. It. Good to see you. Likewise. While Hollywood can breathe a sigh of relief, after 146 days on the picket line, the Writers Guild of America has reached a tentative deal with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. The deal was reached after five consecutive days of negotiating. Picketing is suspended, but the writers will not go back to work until the strike is officially lifted. The vote for that is on Tuesday. While the full language of the new contract won't be available until it is fully ratified, it is expected that the studios met many of the writers' demands, including increases in royalty payments for streaming content and guarantees that artificial intelligence will not hurt writing credits or compensation. What impact can we expect this to have on streamers? Joining us now, we've got Geetha Ranganathan, who is the Bloomberg Intelligence Media Analyst here. Geetha, great to have you here with us this morning. So first and foremost, as we maybe are, are ready to finally turn the page on, on this part of the strikes, assuming that this is ratified here, what is the impact for the streamers here as you've been analyzing this? Yeah, thank you so much, Brad, for having me. So yes, this is definitely a, 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 a landmark agreement. Uh, of course, it has to be ratified, as you just pointed out. But I think this has, you know, major positive implications for the media ecosystem at large, because you, you know, remember, with these strikes, both the writer strikes as well as the actor strikes, uh, you know, production in Hollywood had come to a complete standstill, and that was creating a lot of overhang uh, for some of these media stocks because we didn't know when production was going to resume, and it kind of looked like the content pipeline was was getting a little thin and was almost Almost maybe drying up as we kind of get into 2024. Uh, from a streamer perspective, um, you know, they really haven't seen a huge disruption. If you think of a company like a Netflix or even an Amazon Prime or even Disney Plus, they haven't seen a huge disruption just yet. And that's because they have like this huge uh, library. They have a lot of archival content that they can kind of draw upon on, draw upon to keep, you know, to get new subscribers, to keep their existing subscribers engaged. But the real, uh, you know, the real uh, hit has been felt by uh, TV network owners, right? Broadcast uh, TV network owners where, you know, uh, daytime uh, talk shows, where late night comedy shows have kind of come, come to a complete halt. And we've also seen kind of a disruption in the fall TV schedule. So, you know, this is definitely good news for um, uh, media companies at large, uh, for TV network owners first, and then for streamers also, because obviously their content has also come to a complete production. And this now kind of sets the stage for writing to pick up in the next few weeks time as kind of the deal is ratified. Uh, and so production schedules should kind of normalize uh, into 2024. Begitha, what about the financial impact here for the studios? We, we, like we were just saying, we don't know exactly what is going to be in this agreement, but just judging by the language that the union used, it's likely we're going to see better pay, better residuals, AI-related protection. So when you look at that financial impact here for the studios, how are you gauging that? Or what, what is your best guess just in terms of the potential hit that they could take from the higher pay? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be material. I think if they didn't get a deal in place, that would have been far more detrimental to the studios and to the media network owners because, you know, we just just a few weeks ago, in fact, we had Warner Brothers kind of come out with revised earnings expectations, which they kind of took down. They said that because of the lack of new content, they were going to uh, kind of see a 500 million EBITDA hit in 2023. Uh, so the thing is, as the strikes kind of dragged on and if they kind of dragged into 2024, obviously it would have had a huge impact impact on you know the bottom line for 2024 as well yes definitely they are going to have to pay more in terms of uh, you know compensation in terms of benefits uh, in terms of residuals but again remember it's not going to be a huge Im impact because we we kind of did some math around this in fact the WGA had also put uh, put out some numbers uh, regarding what they expected you know companies to pay and if you looked at kind of Netflix and Disney it was less than about 100 million a year uh, so so nothing uh, too onerous for for the studios, I think really what the sticking point was probably the use of you know AI and kind of putting guardrails around that so that the writer's work is is protected so that it doesn't cut into their income, it doesn't uh, make them lose control over over their work. Uh, and I think it looks like they've kind of achieved what they wanted. And so, from what we know right now, the writers have now been instructed to abandon the picket lines, but also to go to support the actors and and the actors guild. So how much more pressure now does that put on negotiation talks there? 
Yeah, so I think the formal deal uh, with the WGA has to be ratified. That'll probably take a week or two. Uh, but I think this definitely, uh, you know, the, the, it is now kind of incumbent on the studios, I think, to kind of capitalize on the moment, on this momentum. Now that they've got the, you know, the writer's strike kind of ironed out, uh, it's kind of incumbent on them to, to do the same with the actors as well uh, and kind of get, uh, you know, production back on track, both for films, for TV shows. Uh, so I think this definitely kind of gives them some momentum and probably some leverage as well in getting the actors back to the negotiating table. What's good? Sorry, Giva, can you repeat that last point just in terms of the leverage that you think that's going to give the actors, you said, or on the studio side? I think it, I think it gives the studios some leverage now that okay. they've gotten this deal done. I think they can really push for the actors to kind of come back to the negotiating table uh, and get them uh, going so that production kind of resumes across the board. So, Geetha, what do you think the timeline looks like on that? Is this a strike that you think is going to be resolved here within the next week or two, given that pressure that we're likely to see? Yeah, I think, you know, most people initially had thought, I mean, this is kind of, the writer strike had kind of turned out to be uh, one of the longer strikes, right? The longest strike was in 1998, 1988, 35 years ago, which was over 154 days. This one just came in about a week shorter. So obviously they've been striking for a really long time, but it looks like it's kind of worked out for them. Um, but yes, it does definitely put pressure. And I think that it, this will bring kind of the actors also back to the table. Initially, we were expecting this to kind of go into 2024, but it looks like right now, by the end of October, I think as long as they can get the actors uh, uh, union back to the table and negotiate, I think we might see normalized production or kind of resume by the end of uh, end of October, which is which is good news, definitely for both studios and, you know, TV production houses. Certainly will be right. Geetha Ranganathan, Bloomberg Intelligence Media Analyst. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Thank you. Yet another tech company is moving into the artificial intelligence space. Amazon investing $1.25 billion in Anthropic. It's a generative AI firm, and that number may rise up to $4 billion. Now, as a part of this deal, Amazon will take a minority ownership position of the startup. Anthropic will use Amazon's custom chips to build, train, and deploy its future AI foundation models and is also committing to use Amazon Web Services, AWS, as its primary cloud provider. This coming after Microsoft reportedly invested $13 billion in open AI and Google has introduced its own AI product. So, Brad, a lot to unpack here, but certainly my first take, obviously, from this news, from this investment, AI has been will continue to be a priority here for Amazon. They have long been criticized just about the position and how far behind they are compared to some of their competitors, specifically Microsoft and Google and their first advancements or first mover advantage here within this space. We're starting to get some analyst reaction yeah. to this. Scott Devitt out of Webb Bush was saying that today's announcement signals a newfound urgency in Amazon's strategy here to further integrate Gen AI with AWS and certainly sees this as a potential catalyst here going forward. Yeah, you got a new name now to contend with. Of yeah. course, uh, ChatGPT doesn't necessarily have a name name to it, but <laughs> it's talked about by grandmothers nationwide. However, you think about some of the other names that have emerged in the course of generative AI. It has been ErnieBot. It's been Bard. It's been all of these kind of, you know, come up with them as, as you please and see if it sticks. But Claude is the new name that people are going to have to get used to with Anthropic. And, and this was really announced as one that was really based more on, on trust here. And the way that they had tried to position it, at least Anthropic, um, as an AI rival to chat GPT, Claude, um, capable of analyzing more words in less than a minute, or at least 75,000 words in, in less than 60 seconds here. Um, and so really the speed to which that Claude and this rival here um, that Amazon is now invested in is being looked at as a true contender. And now for Amazon being able to have a use case where it can show where a generative AI system like this can be such a, um, a, a beneficiary because of what Amazon already had in place, not just with the data that they have, but with the cloud system and the speed, the latency to which that cloud system is able to handle that workload, that's going to be significant here. You're seeing shares at least pre-market right now for Amazon. I believe we were watching them um, just a moment ago just to see exactly uh, how they are moving. They're, they're higher by about half a percent, but all this, of course, coming off of even more a focus that, that Microsoft is getting here this morning, too. There was an upgrade that Microsoft got on their own artificial intelligence and generative AI plays as well here. So uh, I think that all continuing to round out how the generative AI at least hype phase may be behind us, but for some of the analysts that are looking across the 
the opportunity for them to be able to monetize this and it to flow through to their financial performance, it still is some of the magnificent seven that are the major beneficiaries of that. And why? Because they have the most cash to really continue to invest in this right yeah, now. Yeah, certainly. And it's really, like you said, the AI rally, the hype may not be there anymore because yeah. it's turned into more of a show me story. But exactly. going back to what you just briefly mentioned there with the Guggenheim note out on Microsoft, they upgrade Microsoft, they upgraded the stock here to neutral from sell, basically saying that Gen AI is too strong to ignore. And it's yeah. overshadowing some of the weakness within Microsoft's business when it comes to PC sales, when it comes to slowing growth in Azure, its cloud division there. So that really just points to how important AI is to this market's momentum and how what we've seen play out over the last nine months. Absolutely. All right, we're continuing to watch both of those names going into the open. We're about 10 minutes out from that. All your markets action ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Hi, I'm Brad Smith with Shauna Smith. You're watching Yahoo Finance, and we are at the NASDAQ market site. We've got just inside of eh, six minutes until the opening bell here. Let's see what the stocks are doing here pre-market. We've got Yahoo Finance's own Jerry Blickery standing by. He's got the heat map, the worldwide heat map pulled yes. up behind him. 
Uh, you'll see there's a lot of red around the world right now. A couple of green spots, Tokyo, for instance. Uh, but for the most part, I'm focused on the Americas. And let's just pull up a chart of the S&P 500 futures since midnight. Midnight, you can see we got a dip on the European opening, and then we made a, a lower dip. And we are just off of those lows right now. And I just want to skip to something, which is the bond market. And then we'll hit some stocks in the pre-market. But the bond market, look, 4.5%, 4.52% on the 10-year. Have not seen that in quite a while. This is a year to date chart, and this shows you how we have really lifted off since we had that turmoil in March. And then you take a look at the max chart. That's what I have to go to if I want to take a look at the last time we went back and saw these levels. It's going to be sometime around 2007. And you can tell here that it's an, an inexorable rise uh, to the top here if you're going back uh, even further. But no doubt that we'll probably see some more long-term records break, broken in the coming days. Uh, but not to get ahead of ourselves, I want to check in on some of the stock action this morning. Here's the sector action. Now, uh, I have the sectors in the background here. The background color is controlled by what happened last week over those five days. But basically, everything's red. So not too confusing here. It's just a matter of what shade of red. And in the pre-market, real estate, tech, materials, and utilities, all of those are leading to the downside. There's a lot of uh, anti-duration, I think, expressed in this market here. When you have yields going up, the things that tend to suffer most are the interest rate sensitive sectors, such as real estate, such as utilities, such as tech. And that is exactly what we're seeing. So this risk off flavor that we saw in the markets last week when we had the worst week is, since March is continuing this week. Now, a couple of bright so spots. We've been talking about that Amazon acquisition. You can see Amazon up about 45 basis points there, but Alphabet down half a percent, Apple down one third of a percent. Haven't seen a big gap down on Monday in quite a while. And if we have one, uh, I will be searching through the stats to bring anything uh, interesting to light here. And then let's just close with China, because I've been watching some of the uh, China stocks over the last couple of weeks, having a real rough and tumble time here. And we're seeing more fallout this morning. Um, Chinese, Chinese policymakers really not able to make that incremental next move to stimulate their markets. Alibaba down 2.5%. Pinduoduo in the bottom corner, they're down 3%. And Pinduoduo, one of the day traders' favorites here in the U.S., but you can see on a year-to-date basis, um, it's been a whole lot of sideways chop, guys. All right, Jared, something we are going to continue to watch here. Stick with us as we count down to the opening bell. But let's get to some of the movers here in the meantime as we await 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. First up, we got to talk about Alcoa. Shares are on the move this morning. Off just about over 1% right now after the U.S. aluminum producer appointed a new president and CEO of the company. Former COO William Opplinger is going to be succeeding Roy Harvey. Now, Opplinger has been with Alcoa since 2016, certainly very familiar with the business. And this change at the top coming at a very critical time here for the industry overall, Brad, because we have seen demand pressure uh, prices just a bit when it comes to aluminum, exactly what we're seeing play out here in the U.S. economy, but also on a global scale when we factor in Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the impact that that is having on the aluminum industry. But Opplinger, again, had served as Alcoa's chief operated operations officer since February. Before that was a CFO from November of 2016 to February of this year. So certainly he has years of experience at Alcoa. Yeah, this is going to be a big transition here. And, and especially as you noted, I mean, this is a person that had been at the top of Alcoa, uh, Roy Harvey, since the company had gone public here. Now take a look at the, the year-to-date performance. I think this is the six-month performance. Year-to-date, the company's down by about uh, 36, 37 percent. Our team uh, expertly got that up on the screen for our viewers there. Uh, but you think about the environment, and you, you were laying some of this out. They said off of this most recent second quarter, we saw lower pricing during the second quarter. Global teams had to work to address short-term challenges and drive operational improvements. So when is the improvement, investors might be right to ask here? Well, they expect to see financial improvement in the third quarter of 2023 as the alumina and aluminum segments are both forecast to have reduced costs for raw materials and production. For, for the first half of the year, though, uh, they've kept up with some solid demand, they say, for some value-add aluminum products. But again, if you just look at the financials coming off of this most recent quarter, they had seen a gain for the comparable second quarter in 2022 of about, uh, or a net income gain of about $549 million. That was a loss this year of $102 million in sequential improvement versus the first quarter this year, but still a loss compared to the year over year there. It was certainly very important there to point out. And Brad, I'm going through this release right now and Opplinger really just pointing to where the company is headed in the future. When you talk about 
some of the plans here for Alcoa going forward. Applinger saying that they have strengthened their company and they are going to continue to focus on executing on our strategies to create value not only today, but also to better set up the company for their long-term vision to reinvent the aluminum industry for a sustainable future. So certainly a name to keep on your radar today. Absolutely. Well, we've got the opening bell on Wall Street. Let's take a look at those bell ringers, both at the New York Stock Exchange and here at the NASDAQ, where Survivor, my goodness, when is the last time you watched Survivor? But hey, we've got them here on screen, so you can watch them at least for 10 seconds on the day. <laughs> this is a market check brought to you by Tasty Trade this morning here, and we're taking a look at the major averages as we kick off a new trading week, the final trading week in, or at least the final full trading week in the third quarter of 2023. Where has the time gone here? Uh, taking a look at the major averages, we are down across the board for the U.S. major averages for the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500. Fractional declines there for each of them. Two-tenths of a percent for the Dow, S&P 500 in the red by about a quarter of a percent, NASDAQ composite lower by about three-tenths of a percent. For more on this, let's get on over to Yahoo Finance's own Jared Blickery. He's got those sectors pulled up for us. You know I love some sector checks oh. at the top of the <laughs> trading day. If we're not going to do a sector check, I'm just going to go home. <laughs> Energy in the forefront, the barely just holding on to some uh, gains here. Let's take a, a year-to-date look at energy. You can see it's broken to the upside since July, but it is now just barely uh, hovering over the prices that it had earlier in the year. So perhaps uh, some resistance, but let's move on here. Utilities, real estate, consumer discretionary, those are the bottom three sectors. Also communication services, materials, and industrials. Pretty broad mix of risk off here, but utilities, been talking about the bond market screen higher those yields uh, that is showing up there and uh, not a better story when we're looking at the Dow here we're seeing some green mixed in want to jump over to the Nasdaq 100 and uh, some action in the mega caps but not really because Microsoft is basically unchanged and you can see that flipping from red to green there pretty similar story with Amazon we were tracking that story there meta down 1% Tesla down 1.2% here's a year-to-date look at Tesla um, still kind of ca caught in a kind of a sol sideways excuse me sideways consolidation pattern pattern over the last couple months. And uh, just taking a look at China once again, we can see that board opening up pretty red. Lee Auto down 9%, Neo down 7%. And uh, let's get a check on the entertainment space and also the uh, return to work and travel space. We see Ca Carnival Cruise Lines down 4%, Delta Airlines down 6 tenths of 1%. And moving on, if you're going to the movies, did we have any blockbusters over the weekend? Well, a little bit of green actually to see some, uh, some of the uh, some of the boards here, Disney up one third of a percent, WWE up two and a half percent. So interesting to see that dynamic play out. But I'll tell you what, we have uh, the VIX kind of moving higher here. We got bonds moving higher. And this is a lot of people chattering on Twitter that this is the worst week of the year to be in equities going back 15 years. And here's that 10 year Tino yield one more time. I want to leave with the VIX because the VIX has been moving higher over the last three months. Uh, this is a three month chart rather. And you can see it is at the highest that we've seen in those three months. And if I put a one year chart on, you can see the 18 level, kind of a potential natural resistance level. But if we go higher, we could easily see another drop off in equity. So maybe at the Rubicon right here, the first 5% correction we've had since March could turn higher. But um, I'm going to take a look at the small caps and the small caps are leading lower. That analysis coming up in about 50 minutes, guys. All right, Jared, we look forward to that. Thanks, Jared. We want to stick with some of the movers here this morning and take a look at the pharmaceutical industry because AstraZeneca shares are on the move. Jeffries upgrading the stock here from a hold to a buy rating today. The team there saying that AstraZeneca's assets outside their oncology pipeline are valuable. And at least from Jeffries' perspective, they don't think the street is properly pricing in some of these catalysts that we could see here for AstraZeneca. And it comes with everything here, Brad, from their asthma inhaler, a rescue asthma inhaler uh, treatment, as well as what they have on the docket for acute respiratory failure as well. So certainly they have a number of catalysts, at least from Jeffrey's perspective, that the street is not accurately pricing in. And they're seeing some upside here for AstraZeneca. Yeah, that inhaler and asthma therapy, Air Supra. I had to look at that a few times over just to make sure I got the pronunciation correct. But after looking through some of the potential for this, they're expecting roughly a billion dollars more in sales from this. So that's gonna be interesting to see if that comes to fruition in full, calling it a blockbuster 
rescue inhaler here. Also looking at one of the drugs for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, saying that, that that has the possibility of hitting $4.5 billion in peak sales. Uh, so all of this considered here, you're seeing shares re react slightly right now. They're up by about two-tenths of a percent. But no doubt, this one of the major catalysts driving the shares higher today. Certainly is up just about two-tenths of a percent, just below 68 bucks a share. All right, let's take a look at Dow this morning and J.P. Morgan upgrading that stock to buy with a price target of 55 bucks. We're looking at gains of just about 1%. Now, J.P. Morgan pointing to Dow's evaluation, noting that the stock's underperformance here most recently shares essentially flat since the start of the year. When you take a look at what J.P. Morgan likes about Dow, a lot of it has to do with a dividend yield of just about 5.6%. And, Brad, they're also pointing to the fact that the company has a strong balance sheet. The correlation with oil prices as well. Now, we have not seen Dow move up as we've seen oil prices uh, really take off. But J.P. Morgan making the point that, that that has the potential here to be a catalyst, at least in the short term, for Dow Inc. Yeah, they said the downward momentum uh, or movement, rather, in equity values has given investors an opportunity to purchase Dow shares at a reasonable valuation. All this considered, we're, we're taking a look at the year-to-date view here. It, it hasn't been a stellar outperformer, and it hasn't outperformed at all, actually. It's been, you know, to the downside by about three quarters of a per, or three tenths of a percent over the course of this year here. So not really participating in the Dow rally, the S&P 500 rally or the Nasdaq rally. In fact, it's just lagged everything. So at this point in time, that's really much of the case that J.P. Morgan is making here and that this dip is a potential buying opportunity here. And we'll see whether or not they prove right, because certainly we haven't seen much movement in Dow Chemical here. Yeah. It's essentially right around the flat line. All right, let's take a look at another stock that we will be keeping a close eye on this week, and that is Nike. But today, Jeffrey's downgrading the stock from a buy to a hold and setting their price target to 100 bucks a share. Still about 10 bucks higher from where we are today. Now, analysts are saying that there is risk ahead because of the macro headwinds coming out of China and also reduced U.S. consumer spending. Certainly a lot to unpack here ahead of the company's earnings results later this week. But Brad, when it comes to some of the issues here for Nike, we know China, obviously the macro headwinds there. That could prove to be a real challenge for Nike, given the reliance and given the importance of China to their business. Also, the consumer survey that they conducted saying that they expect a cut back on spending here. 46 percent of the people that they surveyed planning to spend less on footwear, which is a little bit worrisome for Nike and for all of its competitors. Look, I am one of the consumers out there that always looks across footwear, tries to see, okay, what, what am I missing out on? What is the next kind of item that I can get my feet comfy and cozy in? And, and, and quite frankly, I put a lot of things in my cart, but I'm not necessarily purchasing them that the same clip that I was before. And I imagine a lot of consumers out there who are monitoring their own discretionary spending might be doing the same. What does that mean? That means companies like Nike, like Adidas, like Lululemon, like Under Armour, they have to sense what that environment is, and you might see more of a discounting or heavy promotional period. That's something that was called out within this note, and that comes in unit liquidation potentially here. Uh, and in their view, at least the view that we got from J.P. Morgan here today, in their views... Um, their initial first half plan as management flagged second quarter as the toughest sell in LAP and largest unit liquidation LAP in their follow-up access three months ago. If you look at that further here, you could be looking at a very promotional holiday period where Nike and some of the other athletic apparel and footwear brands might be forced to even look across the not just what's selling at the average or the uh, full sale price because Nike wanted to get this back to about 65% of their inventory selling at full price. It's going to be tough with a consumer that's pushing back and looking for more promotions or discounts here. So you got to factor that in as well as what you were mentioning on the China side. So really rounding out that global picture right now. Yeah, increased promotional activity is certainly something that we will be keeping a close eye on when it comes to Nike. Really any retailer as we head into that very important holiday season. I also want to point out though a note that we got from J.P. Morgan on Nike ahead of those results today. And they're a bit more optimistic when it comes to what they're expecting to see from Nike. They reiterated their overweight rating on the stock, saying that they expect Nike more or less to come in in line with expectations. They do see some headwinds when it comes to China. They have lowered their Q1 China estimate to a 13% year-over-year comp compared to uh, what they had initially anticipated 
previously, but overall they reiterated that overweight rating on the stock, the fact that they do see potential catalysts with their price target at 136 bucks a share. So we have some varying opinions out there on the street, yeah. but we'll see what we hear from Nike later on this week. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back. As the United Auto Workers strike heats up, spreading to 38 locations in 20 different states, Detroit is becoming the unofficial site of the Biden-Trump rematch. Now, President Biden is heading to Michigan Tuesday with plans to join the UAW picket line. Then, former President Trump will deliver remarks at an automotive supplier on Wednesday. Joining us now to give us a better view of where things stand, we want to bring Greg Migliori. He's Autoblog Editor-in-Chief. Greg. It's good to talk to you. So just give us a sense of where negotiations stand this Monday morning, because we were talking about Friday, how the expanded strike against GM and Stellantis, but the UAW talking about some of the progress that they have made in talks with Ford. So where are we today? Hey, good morning, guys. So I think as it stands right now, the Detroit Three and the union are pretty far apart uh, in the negotiations. I think Ford is a little bit ahead. Uh, when the union expanded their strike on Friday, they didn't actually include any Ford facilities. They just expanded to General Motors and Stellantis uh, parts distribution centers. So it appears there's a little bit of progress on the Ford front. And of course, they did reach a deal uh, on the Canadian side, uh, north of the border there, they were able to get a deal done with Unifor. So there's a little bit of progress going on uh, on the Ford side, but it does seem like Generally speaking, they're they're pretty far apart on major issues like wages, uh, increases, you know, bringing back perhaps some defined pensions. Uh, there, there's definitely some big sticking points that they need to to iron out. And and what's the pass through to auto vehicle prices here from from your estimation and, and from your analysis, Greg? Sure. So I mean, right now, obviously, there's there's probably not any immediate impact. Uh, you know. If labor costs increase, you know, that can always change the calculus when it comes to the price of, you know, new cars, but it's also just one element. There's a lot of different things that go into uh, the cost of a new vehicle. So that's a little hard to say, you know, you look at things like uh, tax benefits, management, you know, salaries, all of those things go into the price of, uh, you know, the price of new cars. 
Greg, when it comes to the timeline of this, I think everyone's trying to figure out exactly how long this is likely going to drag on for. And then, of course, the financial hit that we could see not only for, for these automakers, but also so many of the suppliers that are affected by this strike. Do you have any gauges in terms of what that timeline could look like? It's interesting because in some ways the strike is, it, it is historic, it's unprecedented. Never has the union struck all three automakers at once. So you kind of wonder, well, how long could this really go on? I think it could be, it could be weeks, it could be, uh, it could be months even. I think it's one of those things where there will be a tipping point where uh, at some point I think the union will want to try to get a deal done um, because, you know, with a number of workers not working, that certainly does, um, you know, that's a financial hit for the workers in their pockets, that sort of thing. So I think at some point the pressure will start to tip. Um, that being said, I think UAW President Sean Fain has done a masterful job of sort of winning the public relations battle right now. He's been able to uh, sort of sense the moment in this country with like the writer's strike on the West Coast and, you know, President Biden, of course, in the Oval Office, who is an unabashed, you know, union person. And he's been able to leverage that into trying to, you know, outright reject, you know, some of the deals, the offers right now that in the past would have been probably pretty good deals. Uh, what he's trying to do, I think, is flip the field and try to bring things back where, um, you know, the union does have a stronger say in things like battery plants, where EV factories are built. And I think what he's sensing is this is the time to do it. There, there may not be a better time. Yeah, I mean, we certainly did see Sean Fain kind of morph from one of the earlier press conferences where he showed up wearing a technical fabric golf shirt into late, late last week's press conference where he was wearing camo. He still had the short sleeve cut. But at the end of the day, he was someone who knew he had leverage and negotiating power. And that, that might also proceed into who the UAW decides to endorse. We do know that Biden's going to visit. We, knew that, we know that Trump, uh, former President Trump is also going to make a visit as well here to Michigan. So all that considered, how does this also play a larger role perhaps in 2024 and what each campaign may be saying about the matters that affect the UAW? Yeah, that, that's a great question. It's it's going to be a very historic, interesting week here in Michigan, that's for sure. You have two presidents, uh, you know, coming to essentially support the workers. It sounds like President Biden uh, may actually be on or near a picket line uh, at an actual factory, whereas um, President, former President Trump will be at more of like a supplier, uh, perhaps in the suburbs. That's, that's what we know right now. So perhaps a little bit farther away from an actual picket line. But regardless, they both want the blue collar vote in 2024. Uh, I think it's definitely going to be a big part of their uh, reelection strategy. Michigan and many Midwestern states are traditionally swing states. So, you know, the votes of these workers could very easily swing the election uh, next year. Greg, when we talk a lot about the impact of this strike and what it could mean down the road. There's obviously a big focal point on the transition to EVs and what that could do just in terms of their ability to continue to meet some of the lofty goals that the Detroit Three automakers have laid out and how this could, I guess, potentially disrupt that timeline. How are you looking at that? And I guess how big of an impact do you see some of these potential agreements, if we do see that, what that means then for the automakers' EV transition process? So I think right now with the UAW, the big part, and this is really important, I think, as part of the nego negotiations, is they want to have a seat at the table for the EV transition. They want to be able to have access to unionized new factories that, uh, you know, may be making the batteries, that may be making the EV EVs themselves. They want a seat at the table for that. And I think if they get that, in some ways that changes the narrative because right now former president trump has been able to sort of cast evs as something that is that some things are being like maybe rammed down the throat by president biden and that they think maybe it's not good for workers if you look at it another way if part of this contract the union gets access to build these vehicles which they are doing today you know every detroit 3 plant is unionized and every factory in the united states that builds EVs is currently unionized So, uh, from the American companies. So 
I think that's a big part of these negotiations. Uh, it's a little tricky too, because a lot of the battery factories are from companies that you know are joint ventures uh, with perhaps overseas companies. So what I think is critical for the union is to get access to things like the battery factories uh, to, to try to unionize those. Greg, great to get your perspective, your analysis on this as well. Uh, we know that you'll be watching this very closely as it plays out in Michigan here. Greg Migliori, who is the auto blog editor-in-chief. Greg, appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks. We've got all your markets action straight ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. We're watching Yahoo Finance. Always hope, and uh, I don't believe believe in a no-win scenario. Like we understand what what a shutdown means uh, to the government, to the American people. Uh, I certainly do not want that, uh, and so we also have some other Republicans on the more moderate side that uh, certainly don't want that. It's an interesting situation. I hope that uh, during this weekend we can come to some solution and come back and work it through. The odds of a shutdown are increasing. Modern, mature governments should not be shutting down. Uh, it's uh, certainly a crazy impact, probably an impact on the markets, an impact on the economy, an impact on all of the government operations essential to keep the society humming along. And right now, the House is talking about going out for five days and coming back next Tuesday. And at that point, they would just have till midnight Saturday to work out a continuing resolution. So uh, things are looking worse than they did a couple days ago. The real problem right now is Speaker McCarthy uh, continues to be really um, led around uh, by a very far right uh, extreme contingent in his caucus. Um, look, at the end of the day, uh, if Speaker McCarthy agrees to put up for a vote in the House, the kind of bipartisan proposals that we're sending from the Senate, I'm confident that they would pass. Uh, the question is whether um, he will put the country before his own interests uh, and, and move forward in that way. Welcome back, everyone. We are live from the NASDAQ market site this morning. The U.S. has agreed to jointly produce weapons with Ukraine, a partnership President Zelensky called historic in a view address. Both weapons and air defense systems will be of particular focus for the nation as the conflict with Russia drags on. In a crucial development, the U.S. has also promised to send long-range missiles to the nation, according to reports. The news could be a major breakthrough for officials in Kiev who long sought weapons to advance their efforts against Russia. Yahoo Finance's own Rick Newman joins us now with a look at what's worth keeping on your radar. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. I, I know a lot of people sort of have Ukraine war fatigue. This has been going on for more than a year and a half, and people may think this is at a stalemate. I think it's important to point out this war is not at a stalemate. We are seeing uh, some continuing developments that are helpful for Ukraine. I'll just tick through a couple of them. They've been gaining ground, uh, territory on the ground in Ukraine. I think what's perhaps more interesting is they have been mounting these um, assaults on Crimea, including an attack recently on what looks like the Black Sea Fleet headquarters in Crimea, which they seem to have destroyed, um, including perhaps killing a top admiral, the commander of, the, of Russia's Black Sea Fleet. And what, what this tells us is that Ukraine is figuring a way to get through Russia's air defense system uh, which is considered one of the best in the world. So this is quite interesting. And uh, the head of Ukrainian intelligence in an interview last week even said that part of what Ukraine is trying to do by penetrating and defeating Russia's air defense system is demonst demonstrate to all the countries that purchase these systems from Russia that maybe it's not so great. Uh, and, and to put a dent in Russia's sale of weapons uh, to other countries, including air defenses. So. Um, there's a lot going on here, and I think what you mentioned at the top there, the, this agreement between the United States and Ukraine to, to jointly produce weapons, uh, this, it, this is a long-term plan. This is a way of saying that uh, the United States and the West are trying to fortify Ukraine, not just in this war, but for the long term, for years and even for decades. And there are going to be major changes in geopolitics that come out of this war. There already have been some. There are going to be more. And I just want everybody to keep paying attention to this. 
Rick, I know you're more focused on some of the longer term implications of this, but I got to bring up since we do have this looming threat of a government shutdown, how is that or would that at all affect some of these support efforts that the U.S. currently has going right now for Ukraine? Well, I mean, most of the analysis of the shutdown is that it will be a short one if, if it happens, uh, which means it should not affect uh, funding for Ukraine. There's already a lot of uh, weapons on the way and a lot of funding in the bank, if you will. Um, the thing to watch for is uh, the, the level of support for ongoing funding for Ukraine. It's going gonna, it's gonna to need more. And we have seen some Republicans recently, you know, they use this phrase, there's no blank check. Some Republicans have come out against any further funding for Ukraine. This is probably going to be an issue in the 2024 uh, election. But uh, then we see pushback from other Republicans, particularly in the Senate, saying we are going to support Ukraine. We're going to keep it going. So I think it's really important to keep an eye on levels of public support for uh, Ukraine. Um, we're going to have some disagreements politically. Um, but for now, I think support remains pretty solid. All right, something we, of course, are going to keep an eye on. All right, Rick Newman, thanks. Bye, guys. Keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. If there was one streaming service that you had to cut, what would it be? Oh, I have to admit, I've been a little annoyed with Max. Mm. It's so hard. Like, every time I, I want to download stuff, it's so limited. It, I find it challenging. Have you finished everything that you wanted to watch on there, and, and now you're just kind of like, all right, I'm good to go here? Yeah, I mean, I took a trip to Hawaii for a work trip, and I was on the plane so long, I needed more. Mm -hmm. And I have to share it with my husband, so that, that makes it challenging, <laughs> you know, because like, he wants to download a lot too, so. Certainly. Yeah.
Seoul, South Korea is a city of many colors, many styles, and many flavors. And seemingly everywhere you turn in Seoul, you'll see Samsung, a company that does, well, many things. It makes semiconductors and TVs, cargo ships and refrigerators. They even sell insurance. But they're best known for producing one of the most dominant lines of smartphones in the world, right up there next to Apple. Yes, Samsung does many things. But one thing Samsung does not do often is invite tech journalists to the very factories where these futuristic phones are made. Until now, I'm Dan Howley, and this is What's Next with Samsung. Okay, it's 3.30 a.m. New York time. We're going to Seoul, South Korea to go hands-on with Samsung's new Galaxy Z Flip 5 and Galaxy Z Fold 5. But maybe even more exciting is the fact that we're also going to Samsung's factory where they build their latest foldable phones. That's pretty cool. There's more to the story. First, I need a coffee though. Okay, so here's the broader picture. The smartphone in your pocket hasn't changed for years. Sure, its camera and processor take better photos and are more powerful, but overall, it's still the same black rectangle that you've always had. And that's what Samsung is trying to change with its newest foldable phones, but changing people's habits can be difficult, especially when it comes to their most important gadget. Yeah, the biggest difficulty is a multi-trillion dollar company called Apple. <laughs> it comes down to one application, iMessage. When Americans got hooked on iMessage, we just couldn't get off. But yeah, it's, it's iMessage. But there's reason to believe Samsung could be the company to inspire a larger move towards foldables, even if that ultimately means inspiring Apple to follow suit. But I do think Apple is closely watching Samsung. I think they're closely watching foldable displays. And they're also waiting, quite honestly, till there's a manufacturer who can produce enough of them for Apple. For years, Samsung has stayed ahead of the curve, outfitting their phones with wireless charging, massive displays, well before Apple was doing any of that. And that history of innovation continues with the Z Flip and Z Fold lines, which are now, and this is important, in their fifth generation. That kind of commitment by Samsung is worth noting, especially when you consider their global market share and influence. A 15-hour flight is a good chance to talk through some numbers. According to CounterPoint Research, Global smartphone revenue hit $409 billion in 2022, down from $450 billion in 2021. In Q1 2023, Samsung controlled 22% of the market, a virtual tie with Apple's 21%. In the US, Apple dominates with 57% of the market. Samsung, according to StatCounter, has just 27%. But in South Korea, it's a different story. Here in South Korea, Samsung controls 63% of the smartphone market. Apple, just 31%. And it's pretty clear the moment you step off your plane, pretty much everyone's using a Samsung smartphone, kind of like a Samsung Cressida. Yeah, so we're uh, touring Samsung's facilities uh, during the rainy season in South Korea. It also happens to be incredibly humid. I am acclimated to New York, so uh, I'm basically just wet all the time. I'm a big old sweaty baby. We're gonna take a bus now over to Samsung's digital city. It's basically a massive campus. I mean, calling it a city is the right thing. Let's go. I've been to Google's campus, huge. Apple's campus, huge. This is right up there with both of those. So I'm here at the tour of uh, Samsung's facilities. We're gonna go get a deeper look at some of their R&D stuff. And you can see these huge buildings behind me. These are all Samsung buildings. Uh, this is just part of the, the complex here. It's, it's a big kind of to-do that we're getting this access to the facilities. We won't be able to film the more sensitive areas, but still we'll be able to get a look and then I'll be able to write about it. So stay tuned. We just got out of Samsung's uh, quality assurance lab, basically showing how they test all of their devices. Uh, we saw different types of machines that they kind of run the actual foldables through, as well as their watches. Different types of drop tests, tumbler tests, different types of ways they drop it on different surfaces, heat 
humidity, cold, uh, water submersion, uh, anechoic chambers. I got to go in one, which is always fun. Uh, and really, you know, this is a part of Samsung's broader push to show that these are kind of the future for their smartphone line. Hey, we're heading down on the subway. We're gonna go check out Gangnam, where I also happen to be staying because I'm bougie like that. Which way? We gotta get that. It's like 100,000% humidity, I think. I've been on this train for five minutes, and I've already spotted five people with foldable phones, whether they're the Z Fold or the Z Flip. People are using them here a lot. <laughs> uh, we're going to go check out the new Z Fold 5 and Z Flip 5, get some uh, hands on with those bad boys, and see what they're all about. So this is what we're here for. This is the Galaxy Z Flip 5, and this is the Galaxy Z Fold 5. They're slick, fancy, have new hinges, but they're also pretty pricey. Starting at $9.99 for the Flip and $17.99 for the Fold, they're also competing with Google's new Pixel Fold and Motorola's Razr Plus, as well as a handful of Chinese foldables. As of now, Apple has yet to join the party. But as you might expect, manufacturing something like this is a bit more complicated than your standard candy bar style smartphone. So to see exactly how they're built, I got up at 5 a.m. to take a three hour bus ride from Seoul to Samsung's factory in Gumi. We're here on Samsung's Gumi campus. Basically, this is where they manufacture uh, some of the biggest products that they sell, especially their smartphone line. Uh, you can hear the cicadas kind of going crazy in the background, uh, but this is where they really do put together the, the smartphones that end up in people's hands. So let me sketch out what I saw inside for you. Inside Samsung's Gumi factory, the company pumps out everything from earbuds to tablets to smartphones. On one floor, custom-made robotic arms grab strips of printed circuit boards that are then filled with electronics components as small as two millimeters and pass through an oven to solder everything into place. On a separate floor, an assembly line of yellow Samsung branded arms put together the company's Galaxy S23, while another line builds the Galaxy Z Fold 5. But what I mostly saw inside the factory was Samsung's massive commitment to foldable phones as its future. And that dedication was even more apparent during the company's unpacked event. Samsung's foldable strategy provides the company with two things, a unique way to get consumers genuinely interested in smartphones again, and more importantly, a means to combat arch rival Apple. With its lineup of foldable phones, the company has something Apple doesn't, a new exciting form factor that gets people talking. Nearly everyone I showed a flip or fold to was immediately impressed with the phone's design and styling. And the company isn't stopping there. Samsung executives hinted at further building out their foldable phones in the future. Unfortunately, as you might expect, they didn't offer any concrete plans. After spending a week with Samsung, checking out its facilities and speaking to some of its representatives, it's clear the company sees foldables as its future. But does that mean that a foldable is in your future? Will you give up that stale black rectangle for something that bends? It's too difficult to tell. While Samsung and its Chinese competitors have embraced the form factor, Motorola now has its Razr Plus, and Google has the Pixel Fold. The one company that has yet to go for a foldable is Apple. In 2021, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman said the company was exploring the kind of technology to make a foldable iPhone. More recently, though, he said they're focusing on an iPad. If, however, Apple does come out with a foldable iPhone and Samsung is still rocking it, then foldables may be the future. And that square rectangle in your pocket just might not be that long for this world.
Great stuff there from Dan Halley. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith at the NASDAQ market site here in New York City. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. Well, it certainly is a mixed picture for stocks this morning as investors look ahead to a big week with key PCE inflation data. That's on tap for Friday and a government shutdown deadline looming in less than a week. Well, let's take a look at some individual movers here. Bitcoin moving lower today, now hovering around $26,000 as major macro concerns loom for the cryptocurrencies. Investors, they're closely watching the Fed's next decision in November for insight on investing in the riskier asset. And NEO is down this morning following reports that the Chinese EV maker is weighing raising $3 billion from investors. This is according to a report from Bloomberg. Now, the report adds to existing concerns about piling losses here for the company. And shares of Rite Aid are plunging after news that the company is reportedly considering a bankruptcy plan that would shut down 400 to 500 of its locations, according to The Wall Street Journal. The remaining stores would either be sold or taken over by creditors, according to the report. Well, from labor strikes to key inflation data, there's a lot on tap this week. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer is here to tell us more, plus his excitement level for all of those things to come. <laughs> Josh, good to see you this morning. Brad, we're always fired up on a Monday morning. We know this. We know this. But we also have a big calendar, too. If you take a look at the calendar that we have this week when it comes to just earnings and economic data alone, you can see it's going to be pretty busy. So you've got Costco earnings tomorrow, give you a good look potentially at the consumer overall. And that's really what I have circled too when we take a look at Thursday and think about Nike. Yes, there's the Nike stock story in it of itself, but I'm most curious, guys, just what we hear from that earnings call. Nike's going to talk a lot about what they're seeing over in China. They're going to talk about a co- potential consumer slowdown in the fourth quarter that we've talked about a lot. And they're probably going to talk about the return of those student loans, which is something we've been curious about and how that's going to impact the overall retail sector. And I didn't even mention retail crime. That Nike earnings call We could have five different story angles from that alone, guys, if we wanted to have a full Nike power hour on Friday. Maybe we'll come back for that. But then when you think about what we're seeing for economic data, you've got two looks at consumer confidence. We know that's been coming down a little bit, specifically as gas prices have been rising. So it'll be interesting to see what we hear there. And then also Friday, the Fed's favorite inflation gauge comes out on Friday, guys, PCE inflation. We are expecting core PCE to come down a little bit from what we saw in July. This will be a reading on August PCE, but should be interesting to see what we hear there. And then, of course, what that means for the Fed is always sort of what we're watching. All right. Certainly, Josh, something that we're going to keep an eye on. And then also, what about the shutdown? Because certainly conflicting reports about what this means for the economy, what this means for the market, whether or not we should be using history as a guide. What are strategists saying this time around? Yeah, Sean, it's going to be interesting with the shutdown. So the shutdown comes, of course, as we're also looking at two labor strikes. So when we're thinking about what it means for the overall economy, there's sort of several headwinds at play when you have that auto strike that economists have been flagging that could impact GDP a little bit. Then you have the government shutdown, which could also impact GDP. That could start that government shutdown again on October 1st. But one interesting note I saw out over the last couple of days from friend of the program, Truist co-chief investment officer Keith Lerner, He flagged that there's normally choppiness in the beginning, right? Markets are a little bit uncertain and people and markets don't really like that uncertainty. But he said in the long run, this has not been something that has weighed on stocks. So expect a little bit of choppiness in the near term. But overall, it's not something that has impacted stocks that much. And I should know Oxford Economics also said a similar thing when we're thinking about GDP. They said this is not something that is going to, quote, sink the economy. Of course, everyone working with the assumption that this government shutdown isn't going to be prolonged in last months here. If that starts happening, I'm sure the projections will change. But for now, it's prepare for a a little bit of waves. But I don't think we're going to get any 10 footers, anything too crazy right now. Hopefully their forecasts are right this time around. All right, Josh, thanks. Well, keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. You have tons of great economic analysis, markets analysis as well, but you're also training for the New York Marathon. (laughs) What is your number one tip for all the runners out there that are perhaps trying to get their miles in and see you when they're running throughout the five boroughs here in New York later? (laughs) Yeah. Well, first of all, you you have to be really determined to do it. You know, do not give up because as much as it can be very painful and exhausting, when you get through that, you feel great. So just keep going. 
and keep training with consistency. You know, you, you can't slack off, so to speak. <laughs> you gotta do it every other day, I would say, or every two days, and really put in the work. You'll, you'll make it. We're at the NASDAQ in New York City. Let's do a quick check of the markets. About 45 minutes into the trading day, this market check sponsored by Tasty Trade. You're still looking at a mixed picture with the Dow just below the flat line, off about 65. S&P and NASDAQ, though, holding on to gains. You have the NASDAQ up about a tenth of a percent. As we start the final trading week of September, and we know equities has certainly been under pressure these last several weeks. Taking a look at some of the moves that we're also seeing play out in the bond market, lots of focus on their 10-year yield. And again, a move even higher this morning, pushing further above 4.5%. All right, continuing to track that, as well as this, J.P. Morgan issued an upgrade to the Dow today, well, to Dow, rather, not the Dow, uh, from neutral to overweight, noting that the recent slump in equity values, they could prove an ideal opportunity to purchase Dow shares at a reasonable value. To some investors, the recent downward dip is a little more than a buying opportunity, but should the decline in industrials and small caps be taken more seriously? With us now, we've got Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery to evaluate this further. Hey, Jared. Hey there. Well, I think it's appropriate to look at the small cap market overall, and we can branch out into some of the different sectors. Uh, small caps usually lead on the way up out of a bull market. However, they did not do that this year um, with that bull market that started last October. In fact, you can see the Russell 2000 going back two years here uh, has basically been trading sideways for about three quarters of that. Uh, and uh, after that liftoff from uh, the October lows last year, well, we got a, a retest of those lows earlier this year, and we may be getting another one. Now, I think it's really interesting because there's a lot of talk about concentration in the markets right now, and I wanted to show the Russell 2000 versus the S&P 500 equal weight. Now, why am I doing it this way? The equal weighted S&P 500, a bit different than how we, differ, than how we normally look at it, um, the equal weight gives every share one basic vote, and uh, we don't have as much influence by the mega caps that we would uh, because of their outsized influence in the regularly cal calculated S&P 500. So this cyan line, which is the equal weight, you're gonna see very closely tracks the purple line, which, it, which is the Russell 2000. Now the Russell 2000 might swing a little bit higher. It has a higher beta, as they say, but nevertheless, I think it's really interesting to look. 
uh, when you have the S&P 500 and you have the mid cap and the small cap index, you put all of those together, it's the S&P 1500. And the only thing that's really moving right now are seven of those, at least on a year-to-date basis. Also want to show you the opposite picture. Here's the NASDAQ 100, which is very heavily weighted towards those mega caps. In the purple line, you can see how that is, uh, has soared this year and has really held on to a lot of its gains while the Russell 2000, while the small caps are way down here. So that just kind of highlights this concentration issue um, and going forward with higher rates and a higher dollar um, a lot of these markets do not like that setup especially the higher growth stocks especially those mega caps so let me bring it back to uh, the industrial sphere and we can take a look at what has happened on a year-to-date basis and you can see there are some clear winners and losers here the number one GE uh, don't count out GE remember that stock and in the midst of their turnaround strategy here's a look at what they've done over the last two years you can see really moved off that October low that I was just highlighting a moment ago for the general market but it is really surged off of that. Here's a look at GE over the last five years. So all the more impressive. Now, it's not that way for everyone. Uh, I think we've been talking about Alcoa. That's down 40%. I'll move on to Raytheon Technologies. That has been basically going sideways over the last five years. But I'll say this, as much as it is a headwind for growth stocks, um, these higher rates, Typically, these are, th these are good things for the cyclical stocks. Now, it depends on the shape of the overall yield curve, but uh, if we are going higher for longer and if we do have a robust economy, the thinking is the cyclical stocks will come back into favor. And so I think uh, that note is uh, kind of touching on that, guys. Certainly. All right, Jared. Thanks so much. Let's talk about take a deeper dive into some of the commentary that we're getting out from the street this morning. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson, well, he's warning that consumer stocks, they could lose their shine as risks continue to grow here for the sector. Now, in that note, Wilson naming slower consumer spending, student loan repayments, higher gas prices, and a tough housing market. That could all add up to major headwinds for the consumer discretionary sector. His team suggesting that investors avoid some of those early cycle winners, think housing, small caps. And instead, he's advising investors to focus on large cap defensive growth and later cycle cyclical winners like energy and industrials. And Brad, one of the lines that stuck out to me within this note is what he had to say just about performance and now we're starting to see some of that performance break down within yeah. the sector. And we take a look at some of the consumer discretionary stocks. 44% of the stocks are trading below their 200 day moving average. So he's making the case that that then points to continued weakness going forward. Yeah, and, and we got to remember which companies really make up this sector as well. It's companies like Tesla, it's like Amazon, um, and that all being included in consumer discretionary stocks. It, it's gained 26% this year, but again, let's remember that this has been a bounce back off of a dismal 2022 for the sector overall. So all this considered, one of the huge things to continue to watch out for is where the consumer in some of their spending, especially in the fourth quarter of this year, signals any signs of a pullback or any signs of antsiness, given the fact that we still have many economists that are trying to uh, evaluate to the best of the possibility whether a soft landing is firmly priced in or whether that is firmly the actual scenario that will come to fruition or whether the consumer will show some other signs of a sharper decline, at least in perception or sentiment of the overall economic landscape and thus pull back more tremendously on their spending. And if businesses, uh, if you will also see that cascade into some of the business spending as well here. Uh, so those two of the ways to look at this, but some names uh, just to throw on your radar with regard to this that other companies have also raised issue with. Jeffries talking about Foot Locker, Urban Outfitters and Nike. They have all downgraded, uh, been downgraded from that firm, uh, citing some of the similar uh, similar characteristics uh, that, are, that are showing up, slowing consumer spend, uh, student loan reinitiation or repayment um, being restarted soon as well, October 1st here. And Goldman Sachs also joining that chorus there, saying that they expect consumer discretionary sector to underperform the S&P by, by seven percentage points oh, yeah. over the next 12 months. So certainly we are seeing more and more strategists here on the street uh, caution and really warn just about the upcoming performance that we could see or lack thereof of the consumer discretionary sector. All right, well, with headwinds threatening to rain on the parade for consumer discretionary stocks, up more than 20 percent so far since the start of the year, what can investors expect from the broader market? Is there reason to be optimistic 
or is cautious pessimism the winning play? Here to discuss that and more, I want to bring in Dylan Radigan. He's a host of Truth or Skepticism on a Tasty Trade. Dylan, it's good to see you. So what do you think investors should be focused on here? Certainly, it has been remarkable how resilient the market has proven to be, given the fact that we have so many challenges and so many headwinds ahead. Yet, it does seem that more and more strategists are warning about what could be a rough couple of months here on out. Well, the market is sort of at a super compelling moment. It's like a rubber, it's like a tight rubber band with equal pressure at both ends because you have this incredibly well-documented and very credible list of headwinds. You guys just did a great job of summarizing it. You throw oil prices in, on and on. Housing, residential housing. Um, and then on the other side, you literally have a quantum advancement in the tools of productivity. And so you have this massive positive force that's once in a you know millennia generation at the highest rate of change ever. Not just AI, not just EV, not just you know one specific component, payments, currency movement, all the but the integrated consequence of all of those things, which is a massive and and sure positive force, just as sure as higher rates, higher oil, higher uh, housing, et cetera. And so I think the reason you see the market exactly where it is is because as you so perfectly articulated, you've had a substantial advancement in price levels over the first half of this year, first, you know, up to let's say early August. And then a war has broken out and the Fed got in and changed things a little bit, which makes it more interesting, but more tense. Volatility goes up. Market levels didn't change that much other than the immediate adjustment lower after the Fed decision and the immediate adjustment higher in volatility. So I'll call it, I, I call it a titanic battle on a razor's edge. And, and the truth is, I personally am short, for better or worse, and I have no standing as a market anything. Other, but I'm saying if you want insight into my um, sentiment, and I say in terms of perform, I'm not here advocating a position. I don't have, I wouldn't. But personally, I believe price levels will go lower and it's you know working today. But personally, I believe in the optimistic tale. So there's some hypocrisy for you. So, Dylan, all these things considered, who, who do you think wins that, that battle as you were describing optimists, it a moment ago? Optimists always win. Optimists always win. And, and what's that fact. on the back of them? Because, because the AI hype, we, we've gotten past the hype phase now as we were discussing Aggr Aggregate the show. productivity. Product, the aggregate, so you have labor. Here's why, here's why this works. Labor is intact unemployment is low and they have been had up there effectively they're not just on strike in autos and in entertainment up until recently but they're effectively striking because the labor market is tight enough and the unions are organized well enough that they have a standing and are doing the best job they've ever done they're playing the three automakers against each other instead of fighting with each other their labor is much more strategically aligned which is good for the economy because it gets a bigger buy-in from that portion of it which because everybody wants a more productive economy they just don't want one where you get all the money and i have to work all the time and so you're in the middle of the negotiation as to how we transition to this hyper productive economic environment creative all this personalizations and all these things that are that are in sort of bubbling up at the same time we um, include everybody which is an economic and a political discussion and in the economic side i'm optimistic because of the tightness of the labor market and their effectiveness in the negotiations at least I, my perception of them being as effective certainly compared to the railroad workers for instance uh, in, in uh, recent months Dylan, do you see the labor market holding up in the face of this higher for longer environment that Powell talked about last week? More and more strategists seem to be uh, factoring in to their forecast. I guess when we talk about the slowing labor market, which we certainly have seen some signs of in the recent monthly reports, how much slower is it going to get or is it going to prove to be we're not going to see that much weakness and the Fed's going to be able to get inflation under control without causing that much destru destruction to jobs? But, you know, that second question I could never answer. I don't, I, no one could credibly answer. But what you know for sure is that the labor pool, the available number of workers, the transition from the baby boomers, the thinness, of, there, are, there are demographic issues which are very favorable to a tight labor market for years to come. At the same time, you're seeing evidence of the leverage in the labor market by the effectiveness of the unions in a way you haven't seen in a long time. That's a great indication of the health and work to put all the stakeholders in the economy together. 
If that number was a not as tight as that is, this would be a real potentially uh, ba bad situation. But it's not. It's like being in a in like on a bicycle. If you're going at a certain speed, you're you're not going to. It's hard to tip over. But if you start going too slow, the bicycle gets tippy. So we're saying, oh, well, maybe higher interest rates will tip over the bicycle or maybe higher oil prices or maybe the housing market being completely, you know, inside out, from the, for, but only for the mortgage buyer, right? It, it's, a, it's very, it's bifurcated. And so the labor market in this case, I think is your best friend. Dylan, appreciate uh, the time here this morning, kicking off the week with us. Dylan Radigan, host of Truth or Skepticism on Tasty Trade. Thanks. Keep, 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 I need you to believe over there. It's easy to get negative. <laughs> it's going to be great. Maybe it's going like, to happen. We love the optimistic right. outlooks. Look, we, 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 believe in, we, we believe in many things over here, Dylan, especially the Eagles uh, and getting a W later on today. Good to see you, Dylan. Uh, all your market action straight ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. always hope and uh, I don't believe believe in a no-win scenario like we understand what would a shutdown means uh, to the government to the American people uh, I certainly do not want that uh, and so we also have some other Republicans on the more moderate side that uh, certainly don't want that it's an interesting situation I hope that uh, during this weekend we can come to some solution and come back and work it through the odds of a shutdown are increasing Modern, mature governments should not be shutting down. Uh, it's uh, certainly a crazy impact, probably an impact on the markets, an impact on the economy, an impact on all of the government operations essential to keep uh, society humming along. And right now, the House is talking about going out for five days and coming back next Tuesday. And at that point, they would just have till midnight Saturday to work out a continuing resolution. So uh, things are looking worse than they did a couple days ago. The real problem right now is Speaker McCarthy uh, continues to be really um, led around uh, by a very far right uh, extreme contingent in his caucus. Um, look, at the end of the day, uh, if Speaker McCarthy agrees to put up for a vote in the House, the kind of bipartisan proposals that we're sending from the Senate, I'm confident that they would pass. Uh, the question is whether um, he will put the country before his own interests uh, and, and move forward in that way.
Live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City, you're watching a Yahoo Finance, and we're watching this looming government shutdown. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy worked through the weekend hoping to secure a deal by the October 1st deadline. While a shutdown isn't expected to have a major impact on markets, it could affect the Fed's November decision. Without action on federal funding by the September 30th deadline, all non-essential activity by federal agencies will be halted. That includes the correction, or collection, processing, and dissemination of government data. Now, a prolonged shutdown could temporarily halt the release of the September jobs, September CPI, and third quarter GDP reports, all info that the data-dependent Fed looks at to determine monetary policy. So, for more on this and really break it down further, joining us now, we've got Courtney Gelman, who is the Strategic Asset Management Portfolio Manager, and E.J. Dion, who is the Brookings Institution, Senior Fellow in Government Studies. Great to have you both here today. Uh, first, as we think about what the significance of this deadline means and whether or not we're able to see some type of conclusion to negotiations in sight, Courtney, I, I wonder from your perspective what the odds are right now that we would see a, a government shutdown. Right. We put the odds at 75%. We think it's really difficult to see a scenario where you don't have a government shutdown. There is certainly the potential for a bipartisan deal coming at the last minute when the Senate moves um, its continuing resolution to the House. That potentially couldn't come until Saturday. So our belief is that we will have a government shutdown. The question is more how long that shutdown lasts. Do you agree with that, EJ? And what is your expectation just in terms of the timeline and how long it could take potentially for both sides to reach some sort of agreement? Well, I agree with Courtney that as things stand now, a shutdown seems highly likely. What's very odd about the situation, and some of the interviews you showed earlier indicate that, is that it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, Speaker McCarthy has decided that he does not want to bring a bill to the floor unless he, it's passed with all Republican votes. But he's got about 20 Republicans on the far right of their caucus who want all sorts of things, uh, cuts and policy positions that will never pass the Senate. And he's worried that if he doesn't have an all Republican bill, some of these uh, folks on the right are gonna try to depose him, throw him out as speaker. Um, there are probably 350 votes on that floor to avoid a shutdown. And I use that number uh, because when McCarthy negotiated the compromise with President Biden uh, earlier this year, uh, a majority of Republicans and Democrats voted for it. So the one way out is for McCarthy at some point to decide uh, that a shutdown is worse for him and his party than the threat to him of getting having a motion to vacate the chair, as they call it. I still think that's a possibility because there are um, uh, nearly 20, I think it's 19 Republicans from districts that voted for President Biden who really, really don't want a shutdown. And so that's a long shot. That's why Courtney's odds are right. But I think in the end, there are the votes there if they want to avoid it, at least have a temporary uh, continuing resolution that allows them to negotiate for another month or two. EJ, do you think Speaker, Speaker McCarthy is in a lose-lose situation just in terms of the options that he has out in front of him? One, he could side, he could be viewed as siding with the Democrats and avoid a government shutdown. And then on the other hand, if we do see a shutdown, obviously the blowback from that, but also the fact that he would then be siding with some of the members of the far right from the GOP. Is that, I guess, how is he thinking about those stakes and exactly what's at risk for him personally? You know, it's nice to have a question where the answer is clear. The answer is yes, he is in a lose-lose 
um, situation, which is why um, this is so difficult. Um, the, he knows that uh, if he passes something with all kinds of provisions to satisfy the far right, that will never get through the Senate, uh, or he may not have the votes at all, thus a shutdown. But if he gets a shutdown, that's very bad for him and his party uh, going forward. This is configured in a way uh, that he and his party will take most of the blame for this. And it's also a historical thing, the shutdown has generally been a Republican tactic. Um, so the average voter um, who may not follow all of the ins and outs of what goes on in Congress is more or less inclined to blame Republicans at this point for a shutdown because that's something they've done before. So yeah, he's in a very difficult position. Um, I think, I mean, I don't think he's gonna listen to my advice, but I think in the end, he'd be better off to govern uh, and let the chips fall where they may. You might even have a situation where Democrats at some point say, look, if there's a motion to vacate, we'll temporarily back you just so we can govern. And I think the behavior of Democrats in the next uh, several days is going to be really interesting to see what they might do, uh, which would either put McCarthy in a more difficult situation or it might get uh, some resolution that doesn't lead to a shutdown. EJ, I feel like you were all of us earlier in saying that it doesn't have to be this way. And I mean, when I think, Courtney, about the, the broader implications here as well, in your notes, you mentioned that this could impact things like the dissemination of data. This could impact the U.S. credit rating. So what type of real ramifications are we looking at here? Right. Well, the, for the ramifications certainly aren't as severe as the debt limit, which was when McCarthy did have to make that deal with Biden. So we actually don't think that McCarthy has the cover right yet, right now to make the deal with Democrats. You know, when we're one to two weeks into the shutdown and the Republicans are getting more blame, that might give him the cover that he needs within his own party. But in terms of the ramifica ramifications, typically the stock market doesn't react that much. We do have a lot of headwinds, as you all have repeatedly discussed over, over the morning. So we do have a lot of headwinds, and this is exacerbated those concerns. Certainly companies levered to you know, government and federal funding, those are going to be more impacted than the market overall. Typically not a huge GDP impact, especially because this is happening at the beginning of a quarter, so there's time to make this up. The Fed won't have access to data, but they will potentially still be able to get the September data because um, that data was collected. It just won't be disseminated. I'm sure that if they ask for it, they can you know, be able to get it. Um, and they will still have private data that's still being collected and being published. And then the credit scenario is something that I would say we're the most concerned about, where if you have Moody's put the U.S. on credit watch over the process of a government shutdown, similar to what we saw in 2011 when the S&P downgraded the U.S. off of the process of the debt limit and earlier this year when uh, Fitch downgraded the U.S. So we are concerned about a credit watch. Um, but we don't necessarily think that Moody's would make the decision to actually downgrade the U.S. debt. We think that they would make that decision later, um, potentially when you have another debt limit fight in 2025. Courtney, why do you think that is? Why don't you think they would be willing to make that decision now? Again, I mean, this is this is less of an issue than the debt limit. Um, you know, this is... I, we, it's much better to have these types of arguments over things like government funding rather than the full faith and credit of the U.S. Um, so we don't think that they would make the decision to actually downgrade the U.S. more that they would put the U.S. on credit watch. That certainly still has you know, ramifications. We could have equity headwinds. There could be further upward pressure on yields. It certainly doesn't help the U.S.'s global standing um, with other countries trying to challenge the U.S. dollar. Uh, but it's not you know, this, the government shutdown is not the same thing as us breaching the debt limit. Courtney Gelman, EJ Dion, we have to leave it there. Of course, we're going to continue to watch this as the clock ticks down to that October 1st deadline. Thanks so much to you both for sharing your perspectives. Good to be with you. Right, Thanks. We got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
It's a new era for COVID-19 vaccines with the drug now being rolled out commercially, but several supply and insurance roadblocks are causing some confusion for people out there and also for pharmacy. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kimlani joining us now with those details. Anj, what do we need to know? What do we need to know? That's right, Jonna. Unfortunately, we're hearing uh, reports of individuals getting denials of coverage for their COVID vaccine or running into problems when trying to get insurance coverage. And to that end, the health department wrote a letter to insurers on Friday asking them to make sure that these coverage requests and these claims do go through, regardless of whatever is going on internally uh, for the, you know, the following the process. They said, quote, whether the problems are directly within your organization's control Control or the control of your partners, your obligation as a plan or issuer is to ensure that your members have coverage for COVID-19 vaccines without any cost sharing. And it's not, uh, you know, conditional uh, on other parties' compliance. So saying that the insurers really do have to take the lead role here in ensuring that the government's promise to ensure free vaccines as the market first turns commercial remains in place. And to help do that, uh, there has been, you know, some uh, focus on exactly which uh, covers, which payers uh, have which rules. So if you take a look at the private market, for example, vaccines and visits to pharmacies or to uh, places, uh, sites where they do have vaccines are supposed to be covered with no cost sharing. Medicaid and Medicare, of course, uh, Medicare specifically for the Part B, no cost sharing for in-network sites. And then for the uninsured adults, the health department did launch a public-private partnership earlier this year, $1.1 billion invested in ensuring that adults do have access to these vaccines and that they will, they will not incur any cost at the site of the vaccine. Meanwhile, kids also guaranteed. So it, it does, you know, with all of this already in place, they're still running to this issue when the, as this, uh, you know, uh, industry has come to the first commercial launch of these vaccines. They are running into some hiccups. There seem to be some uh, pain points. We know that, of course, there are only two vaccines on the market right now. That's Pfizer and Moderna that have gotten the green light for those updated boosters. But uh, we're still waiting to hear any news from Novavax and their authorization. But that even with those two, which are, you know, have been on the market through the government program since the beginning of the pandemic or since those uh, first got authorized, we're still seeing this uh, unfortunate hiccup. So it does throw into question what that market is going to look like in total for the booster sort of season and whether or not they can get over this hiccup and get more doses in arms. Yeah, booster season, but also testing season as well here, Anjali, when we think about the availability of tests, what is that looking like and are people gravitating towards making sure that they can take advantage of the free tests where available? That's right. Well, you know, the government also launched that reordering of the four tests per address uh, just today. I got mine. I hope you guys got yours. Uh, really easy to get at covidtest.gov. Definitely seeing an uptick, of course, in the cases and that thus the demand for these tests. And that's sort of why the government has been ensuring that these tests get out so that there is the access as well. This is also one of those things where, you know, those rapid at home tests differ from the PCR tests, which do then get sequenced and sent to labs and subsequently to the CDC. The at-home tests, while they don't follow that process, do at least give some insight, you know, generally of where the increase in cases are. So it's an important way to sort of keep track as people would share, you know, uh, photos or whatever of their, of their COVID positive tests. So an, in, uh, uh, an important way to gain more insight as those free tests and as the, the push of tests from earlier on that we saw in the pandemic has waned, uh, certainly a, a different point, though the government has ensured that tests should remain covered by insurers. All right. Yahoo Finance is on. Anjali Kamlani, excellent coverage as always. Thanks so much, Anjali, for breaking this down. Well, we've got all your markets action straight ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Have you tried pickleball yet? Not only have I played pickleball, I have a combination of uh, eight rackets in two locations. Oh my gosh. Okay, so you got like one of the racket bags. You're official now too. I have a racket bag that I carry multiple rackets and uh, let's just say, Brad, that I bring my balls. All right, find, sign that man up for the, for the majors for sure.
If you're looking to invest in Apple's latest iPhone model, it may take you a while to get it. Well, the basic model of the iPhone 15 taking nearly twice as long to get to customers as the iPhone 14, according to CounterPoint research, showing that demand for the upgraded device is still high here. Now, you're taking a look at the suite of products, at least for the iPhone here, of course, the lion's share revenue producer for the company. And it's remarkable, I think, for the fanfare that continues to get spun around the iPhone 15, and especially that top end side where the larger question was, are consumers going to be willing to pay for that top end? Now, we should note that any time that there is a new model that's announced, there are typically a wave of purchasers in that first tranche that are looked at as some of the diehard will get the, the top end just to be able to say that they were in that first wave of the experience. So perhaps the longer tail could be more important to stay tuned and focused on here as well. Here. Yeah, Brad, I mean, it was pretty remarkable seeing all the video and the pictures from the lines, people lining up to be the, one of the first ones to get their hands on the 15 model. There certainly has been a lot of hype going into this release. Lots of questions about what demand was going to look like. So if you base it off the activity that we saw at stores and also this report here that we're talking about, clearly it looks like demand is there at least for now. But questions about whether or not that's going to be enough in order to keep Apple or get Apple back on that upward trajectory that we saw during the first several months of the year. Over the last three months, shares are off just about 6%. Year to date, though, they're still up about 34%. So we talk about this higher for longer uh, rate environment, what that could potentially mean to some of these larger cap tech names. We know higher rates, obviously a big risk there for those names. Absent of a real other catalyst outside of this new lineup when it comes to Apple. So there's a lot riding on these sales numbers, what we're going to see over the next two months, three months into the holiday season, and whether that's enough to turn around Apple's momentum and really get it back on track when we talk about the significant gains that shares have made since the start of the year. Yeah, the context coming into this cycle, especially for Apple and for the smartphone shipments overall, IDC had projected that this was forecasted to decline by 4.7 percent year over year in 2023 to about 1.15 billion units. That would be the lowest volume in a decade. So that's kind of the backdrop, the context that we're coming to you with on this. However, it's a downward revision as well from the previous forecast of down by 3.2 percent there. So that really driven by a weaker economic outlook, which is why we bring all of this into the full kind of uh, breadth of the conversation here. But from an OS perspective, IDC also expects iOS shipments to see 1.1 percent growth in 2023. That would be an all-time high share of 19.9 percent as iOS continues to be more resilient resilient to macro challenges than Android here. So that's something to look at. Also, the regionality of this, something to keep in mind here. As we think about India and China as their market entry plays in India certainly have caught the attention here as of right now. And we'll see if that has a longer, uh, longer kind of tail cycle to that as well. Yeah. Um, but that, the Apple story here on the day, uh, but in a different type of tasty treat, if you will. Certainly. Let's talk about Krispy Kreme yeah, there, we go. there right, Brad, too. because the headline that caught actually your attention, we're going to bring here to our viewers, shares on the move after their CEO, Michael Tattersfield, will leave his post at the end of the year. He's going to be replaced by the current chief operating officer, Josh Charlesworth. This is effective on January 1st of the new year of 2024. Shares in the company have gained around 24% since the start of the year, up just a fraction in today's trading, up just about a tenth of a percent. But the loss of Tattersfield at the helm, certainly a significant move here, and one that we want to point out, given the revenue growth that he has achieved as CEO of the company, bringing revenue of just around 550 million in 2016 to a more than expected 1.6 billion in 2023. Dramatic growth at Krispy Kreme under Tattersfield. Yeah, even with the move that higher that we've seen over the course of this year by about 24 percent, past five years though, down by about 33 percent for shares of Krispy Kreme. All right, well, that's all for us today from the NASDAQ market site here in Times Square. Rochelle Kufo has you for the next hour. See you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. Hollywood writers have breached a tentative deal with studios, which could lead to relief in one corner of the industry. We'll discuss which one coming up. And with a government shutdown deadline looming, how could this impact disaster relief during peak hurricane season? I'll speak with a former FEMA administrator this hour. Plus, looking to travel for the holidays? We'll tell you how much you should expect to pay and when you should plan to fly during the busy travel season. But first, let's take a look at how markets are faring this morning. All three major indices looking at a fairly mixed picture here. We were seeing some session lows, but we see the Dow here just down ever so slightly, about nine points on the day. The S&P 500 there, seeing a little bit of green there. We're seeing energy, the only green S&P sector. Real estate and utilities under pressure as the worst performers. Tech heavy Nasdaq there also just slightly under pressure as well as we are in this final trading week of September. Let's also check in on the Treasury market as well. As we can see here, looking at the five year, up about half a percent on the day. The 10 year solidly up about almost 1.8% on the day. They're up at, currently at 4.5%. And the longest term 30 year yield, that's up about 2.5% on the day as well. Well, Hollywood writers have reached a tentative deal with studios after 146 days on the picket line. They may be able to finally hang up their signs. Now, the deal is expected to be ratified within the next week or two. Then the studios will have to work, work to do with the Actors Guild. Now, SAG after tweeted following the WGA news saying, quote, we look forward to reviewing the terms of the WGA and AMPTP's tentative agreement, and we remain ready to resume our own negotiations with the AMPTP as soon as they're prepared to engage on our proposals in a meaningful way. Well, joining me now for the latest on this is Alex Weprin, media and business writer for The Hollywood Reporter. Good to have you on the show, Alex. So at least some welcome relief here at this point. What do we know about what this means in terms of the shows that we can expect to come back online and start production? Well, Rochelle, you know, the first shows that are going to come back are the late night shows. They've been dark since the writers went on strike back in May. Those should come back online in the next uh, couple weeks or so. Depends on when they can get staffs to the office. Uh, the thing with the, a lot of the other scripted movies and TV shows, though, is that those really can't resume production until SAG-AFTRA has a new deal as well. And so that's why I think there's going to be a big push to try and resolve uh, the strike with SAG-AFTRA because the clock is ticking right now for the holidays. Uh, so I think that there's going to be a big push to kind of resolve that strike. And until they do, most scripted film and television is still going to be shut down. So then in terms of some of the, obviously there's overlapping issues with the WGA that SAG-AFTRA has, but what are some of the more complex ones which are going to hold up production getting back on track? You know, there are a couple of issues this time around that just didn't exist before. You know, there are some like, you know, pay raises and residual, increased residuals. Those are obvious. Those are things I think everyone is expecting to deal with. But the role of artificial intelligence in film and television creation, that's a whole new problem for them to solve. And so the, the specific language around how they can use AI, that's been a sticking point for the writers. They did come to a solution. We don't know what the specific details are, but they seem to come to an agreement. That's going to be a sticking point with the actors as well, who are really worried about you know, uh, virtual actors or AI generated actors being used in film and television production. So that's a sticking point. And then the other big sticking point is, you know, streaming. You know, uh, when this deal was ratified, uh, SAG after uh, the last deal, streaming was a thing, but it, it's now become the dominant place for scripted film and TV. And they believe that they should be paid commensurate with what they were getting paid for their linear television programs. That wasn't the case. And so these two new technologies, streaming and AI, those are kind of the big sticking points. Because it really does come to really future-proofing the industry. As you mentioned, a lot of things just weren't on the radar when a lot of these original deals were negotiated. Um, and I do want to bring up something that you mentioned, which is about the timing. Because you were saying in your notes that um, and the importance of reaching a deal before Thanksgiving, otherwise we could see these strikes go into 2024. What sort of domino effect then does that mean for production and, and even being able to get some of these shows out? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, it, it, let's say that SAG and uh, the, the studios resume talks at some point this week, maybe later this week. Then you're talking about a couple of weeks to negotiate a deal at best, and then it'll take a couple of weeks for it to get ratified. SAG is a very big union. There's over 100,000 members. And at that point, you're just about at Thanksgiving. And between Thanksgiving and Christmas, that's when Hollywood usually shuts down. 
So, you know, at that point, most productions probably won't be able to get up and running until 2024. Maybe there will be a push to kind of get some up and running in between Thanksgiving and Christmas. But, you know, at that point, you know, it's going to have a major impact on the bottom line, especially for the linear television channels, which won't really have new shows until later in the spring. So there really is a sprint here to get a deal done, I think. Uh, and the sooner they can get one going, the sooner they can get these shows back on the air, and uh, the sooner that the the companies that own these channels and streaming services can kind of reverse their financial fortunes. And Alex, we know that some shows, including The View, still went ahead with, with non-union workers while the strike was ongoing. If the strike does continue and they, they still haven't really reached an agreement there, what does that mean for perhaps some more of these shows just getting to a breaking point where they do decide to take on non-union workers just so they did not like bleeding billions of dollars here? Yeah, so I mean, like the daytime talk shows and, and the late night shows, you know, they, they all use WGA writers. Uh, the hosts are covered under a different SAG contract. They're not actually on strike right now. I do think that'll actually allow the, the end of the W the writer strike will allow them to return to production fully because they'll be able to bring back their WGA writers. So that'll return those shows to work. I think you're less likely to see non-union workers in scripted film and TV. That's the contract that SAG is on strike against right now. Uh, and so that's that's an issue where you know I don't think the studios are going to lean into uh, to 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 non-SAG actors. I think that's too risky for everybody involved. I think they're just going to really push for a new deal with the union. And so, Alex, if you had to give your best case scenario at this point, given that, you know, they are still quite far apart on some of the issues when it comes to sag After, what would the best case scenario look like from here? The best case scenario is that sag After takes a look at the WGA deal and says, you know what, this is pretty good. And they kind of structure their own deal around the WGA's deal. If they did that, they might be able to come to an agreement pretty quickly. Um, it's just a matter, there are some SAG specific issues that they're going to have to work through. But if they really kind of like what the WGA has, maybe they can get a deal done in a week or less than two weeks. And in that case, they might be able to try and expedite, you know, the ratification of the deal and get production up and running as soon as possible. And as you mentioned, the clock is definitely ticking there. Appreciate you getting us up to speed. Alex Wehrprin, media and business writer for The Hollywood Reporter. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rochelle. Well, taking a look at stocks sliding as we start the final trading week of September, investors are following Congress's efforts to avoid a government shutdown, as well as absorbing the fact that central banks will keep rates higher for longer to quell inflation. Looking ahead, we have the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, PCE inflation, to look forward to on Friday. Now, our next guest says we have a long and winding road to the Fed's 2% inflation target. Joining me now is Brian Jacobson, Annex Wealth Management Chief Economist and Strategist. Thank you for joining me this morning. So, so talk about this long and winding road and how it's going to look at this point, given that markets, they, they seem to now be somewhat at least believing the Fed's trajectory from here. Yeah, I think that the Fed or the markets have really bought into the idea that the Fed is going to hold rates about where they are for the foreseeable future because inflation is going to head towards 2%. Uh, now, the problem is that's probably not until 2026 that we get there. So between here... And there, it is likely to be a bumpy road. We know that energy prices have already gone up very materially. In the last inflation report, the energy component was up 5.6% for that single month. Now, when we look ahead, it's likely not going to continue to rise at that pace, but there is an upward bend towards that type of uh, inflation, that source of inflation. So you've got energy, possibly auto costs also going up as far as the UAW. W strike, what does that do in terms of supply chains, the price of used cars and new cars? So over the next few months, we are likely to see some almost reversal of the improvement that we've seen so far on the inflation front. But we do believe we will get to 2% inflation. It's just there might be a little bit of pain to get there. And Brian, speaking of pain, obviously you have a looming government shutdown. Some analysts believe that could perhaps take a rate hike off the table, depending on how deep it goes. What, are your, what is your estimation of perhaps how the government shutdown might perhaps lessen the load for the Fed going forward? 
I think that it's not necessarily the government shutdown because in the typical one, that would only shave off like fractions of a percentage point of GDP growth because oftentimes what happens is people still get paid, uh, they still consume, but then services might get disrupted only in a protracted shutdown. Uh, we believe that it is going to be a more protracted shutdown that we see this time, unlike the ones that just lasted over a weekend uh, or even just over a week. So this could be a multi-week process, in which case the economic pain could just very slowly build. Uh, our bigger concern here at Annex on our investment committee isn't necessarily the government shutdown. It is that consumers seem to be moving from what we called profligacy, so kind of spending a little bit more than what they otherwise would, to austerity, where they're already seeing interest costs rising, pulling back on non-essentials. And so it's really that consumer trajectory going from the profligacy to austerity that has us on high alert for maybe the peak of economic activity was in the third quarter, and now it's going to be a slow slide a little bit lower for the next few quarters here. And you raise a good point because there has been some concern that a lot of the Fed's medicine still hasn't really hit the consumer directly and we will start seeing that showing up. So what do you think are going to be the dominant themes that are going to really take precedent over the next month or so? I think that over the next few months, people are really going to be on uh, high alert as far as what's happening with any of the higher frequency consumer data. Uh, what we get this upcoming Friday is looking back a month, but you do get more frequent reports as far as, uh, you know, like chain store sales. I'm really looking forward to seeing what Costco has to say uh, when they have uh, their announcements. And so it's really about some, coming from the business area as far as what are they seeing in terms of consumer behavior. Uh, last week, uh, we heard from a few uh, restaurants that people were buying less alcohol and so kind of trading down a little bit. So they were still going out. It's just that maybe they weren't uh, going out to the fancier restaurants. They were dialing it back a little bit. And so I think that markets are going to be really watching to see whether or not the full effect of Fed rate hikes is that actually coming to the forefront now. Fed hikes operate fast and slow. And now we're in that slow period where it's sort of the slow bleed really tightening the screws on consumers. And so, Brian, with that in mind, then, in terms of the opportunities you see in the market, where are some areas that you think investors perhaps may have missed the boat and where they really should be looking as you look at things like oil prices and the potential for some of the recession signals that the 10 year yield is flashing? Yeah, having that 10-year yield above 4.5%, that actually is the area where a while ago on our investment committee, we were thinking that that might be the point at which we want to start adding duration to the portfolio. So beginning to buy things like the 10-year treasury. It's not to say that it can't go higher from here, but for longer term value, we do think that there is a lot to be said for beginning to add very gradually to those longer duration positions. So within the fixed income portfolio, you know, there's nothing wrong with cash. Cash is not trash anymore. It's yielding more than what you get on the 10-year treasury. So in terms of our strategy there, it's kind of this um, barbell approach on the short end and then slowly add to the long end. On equities, we still think that there's good opportunity in energy, may as well ride some of the momentum there, and then also healthcare. So healthcare and energy are the two areas that we had the biggest overweights to our portfolios for uh, the year so far. And it's an area that we still think that there's good opportunity going forward. For energy, it's more about momentum right now. But for healthcare, we view that more as a long term kind of a value play. So, certainly some opportunities to be had if you know where to look. I appreciate you joining me this morning. Brian Jacobson, Annex Wealth Management Chief Economist and Strategist. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, well, I'm watching shares of Meta platforms dip today after a Reuters report reveals that the SEC has collected thousands of messages from Wall Street staffers on unapproved messaging apps like Meta's WhatsApp and Signal. Now, this is part of the securities regulators probe into Wall Street's use of private messaging apps to discuss work. The crackdown has lasted two years, initially targeting broker dealers for potential breaches of record keeping rules, netting the SEC over $2 billion in fines when it found that staff at Big were discussing deals and trades on personal phones and apps.
Now, this new report shows that the investigation has expanded to over a dozen investment advisors at firms like Carlyle Group, Apollo Global Management, TPG and Blackstone. Executives at the firms had to give in their personal phones so that messages discussing business could be copied and sent to the SEC. Now, firms originally resisted calling the probe invasive. The Managed Funds Association saying in a statement that the action, quote, sidesteps due process and creates a dangerous precedent. We'll be keeping an eye on this developing story for you here on Yahoo Finance. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. always hope and uh, I don't believe believe in a no-win scenario like we understand what would a shutdown means uh, to the government to the American people uh, I certainly do not want that uh, and so we also have some other Republicans on the more moderate side that uh, certainly don't want that it's an interesting situation I hope that uh, during this weekend we can come to some solution and come back and work it through the odds of a shutdown are increasing. Modern, mature governments should not be shutting down. Uh, it's uh, certainly a crazy impact, probably an impact on the markets, an impact on the economy, an impact on all of the government operations essential to keep the uh, society humming along. And right now, the House is talking about going out for five days and coming back next Tuesday. And at that point, they would just have till midnight Saturday to work out a continuing resolution. So uh, things are looking worse than they did a couple days ago. The real problem right now is Speaker McCarthy uh, continues to be really um, led around uh, by a very far right uh, extreme contingent in his caucus. Um, Look, at the end of the day, uh, if Speaker McCarthy agrees to put up for a vote in the House, the kind of bipartisan proposals that we're sending from the Senate, I'm confident that they would pass. Uh, the question is whether um, he will put the country before his own interests uh, and, and move forward in that way. Let's do a check of the markets sponsored by Tasty Trade. Looking at a mixed picture now with both the S&P and the Nasdaq now both in positive territory, though ever so slightly. The Dow still under pressure, though, down about 26 points, but still at the highs of the session. The S&P 500 there currently up about a quarter of a percent and the tech heavy Nasdaq up about a third of a percent as well. 
Well, the ongoing battle between automakers and the United Auto Workers Union is in focus today after expanding its strike to 38 parts and distribution centers of both Stellantis and GM. And our next guest is laying out reasons why she says automakers need to step up. Carla Walters, Center for American Progress, Senior Director of Employment, joins me now. Thank you for joining me this morning. So, Carla, talk about the ways that you think some of these companies should be stepping up right now. Yeah, so we have seen that the big three, GM, Stellantis, and Ford, really failed to put forward a contract that, or contract proposals that demonstrate that they respect their workers and support a just transition to electric vehicles. We have seen CEO profits and pay and and company profits really climb over the last several years. And meanwhile, workers are being asked to do more with less. Uh, Workers on 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 the picket line are saying our jobs used to be the gold standard for the working class and we want to see that again. Um, so now they are they are asking for several measures to make that such to make sure that they're re- being rewarded for the wealth they help uh, help create, um, and we are seeing some some positive signs. We're seeing the announcement that President Biden will be visiting the picket lines this week, and um, as as the the UAW has ramped up its its strike uh, striking activity against GM and Stellantis, they've announced that they are in um, productive negotiations with Ford and have decided to not ramp up their activity there. So they are continuing to strike against just one facility at Ford. So as we see this play out, we'll really be watching for can those productive talks with Ford and hopefully with the other automakers um, become more productive and can we see resolution? And ultimately, if Ford gets to resolution first, what we will expect is that to put pressure on the other automakers. So to that point, then, what does this mean for in terms of leverage now that the the strikes have expanded, but you also have some of these more positive and productive negotiations going on with Ford? What does this do in terms of leverage between these two sides? I think what we're seeing is I, I think there's we're really in this moment right now where we're seeing um, workers in motion across the economy, across different sectors. Um and our labor market being tighter so that workers have more leverage um, and pushing for more than they've had in, in several years. And these workers have been living under the, the conditions of the last recession for far too long. We saw in the negotiations of 2008, where the federal government stepped in to bail out the big three auto workers or automakers, auto workers um, step in and say, we will take concessions in order to save these companies from the brink of bankruptcy. Um, these conditions are really in the, the rearview mirror for CEOs and for the companies in terms of profits, profitability, and pay. But for workers, they're still continuing to live under this. And they're they're hoping that they have leverage in this moment and pushing their, their, their relative power in this moment to demand an end to a two-tier wage system that put too many workers in a position where they're earning barely enough to get by, um, an increase in cost of living uh, agreements. Um, better support for their retirees so that they can they can continue to then push from this moment of relative strength for a return to these better working conditions. And you raise a good point because obviously some of this is catching up from the bailout, as you mentioned there, and then also, of course, with COVID as well. But then also when it comes to companies looking at future proofing, the investments that they're making with electric vehicles and automation as well. What does this mean then for what the future of of the auto labor industry looks like when we still don't even know just how advanced some of these things can be? And already these negotiations are so tense. Yeah, we're really at this critical moment in the industry where we're not just looking at labor negotiations, but we're looking at a push towards what does the future mean in terms of electric vehicles. And really, we see two things happening at once here. We see maybe three things. We see automakers really making investments here. We see the federal government investing in these companies saying that we want to make sure we remain competitive as a sector. And we see workers saying, hey, we're a part of the sector too, and we deserve to be rewarded for the wealth we help create. And ultimately, we need to be able to see for the future strength of this industry, for um, our ability to ensure that this industry continues to be a robust sector that helps support a middle class, a middle outgrowth strategy through our economy. We really need to see all those things work together at once to support good jobs and support our domestic production. 
And Carla, a lot of people wondering where things go from here. Ford um, saying on Sunday that there are still significant gaps to close in the negotiations. And, and these the, this is the, the company that they're having the productive talks with. What is the worst case scenario as this, as this continues then? Well, I mean, I think we, we obviously want to get to resolution here in an expedient manner. Workers' livelihoods are on the line. And we know that UAW has is is preparing to ensure that is both at you know negotiating and at the table, but also saying we're going to back up our workers. We're going to make sure our strike fund is is strong enough to withstand a, a longer duration strike. But ultimately, we need the automakers to come to the table and negotiate in big in in good faith. You know, the lack of a, of good contract proposals from them got us here in the first place. So really, it's about now how can they step up and make offers to workers that are going to be meaningful. We'll certainly continue to track that. We appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Carla Walter, Center for American Progress, Senior Director of Employment. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
It's been a tough month for the market's top 500 companies, but that's not a surprise. September has always been notoriously bad for markets. The S&P 500 has fallen 4.2% and it's on track to be a second straight losing month. For more on this, Yahoo Finance reporter Jared Blickery, who's been tracking all of this for us. Hey, Jared. Hey, Rochelle. Uh, not only is September typically the worst month for stocks, but we are entering, this is the first day of the last week of September, which is the worst week of the year for stocks. Uh, a couple of different ways to slice this and dice this. Let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, where I'm plotting the sector action. This is the year to date, and you can see the mega cap sectors with communication services and tech. Those are doing the best, but on a month to date basis, Lots of red there. Uh, we can see energy is the only green spot, XLE in the upper left. And then in the lower right, we got real estate that's very interest rate sensitive, along with tech, also interest rate sensitive. But then we have the cyclical sector of industrials and we have consumer discretionary materials. So pretty broad swath of uh, sectors here in the red. Uh, but we want to think about what's coming down the pike. Uh, I've been I've been slicing and dicing the numbers uh, myself, and so is Ryan Dietrich over at Carson group. This is the S&P 500 over the last six months. And you can see we are just now dipping below this potential neckline right here. But here are the stats that I wanted to throw out at you. Uh, the last time the S&P 500 was down at least 1% in both August and September, the way it is this year, October was up 8% in, in 2022, 8.3% in 15, and 10.8% in 2011. Higher nine of the past 10 times going back to the late 1950s. As bad as things feel, do not lose faith just yet. And I think a lot of the uh, strength that we're expecting to the end of the year also comes from the fact that we had a tremendous run-up in the first seven month, months of the year. That was January through July. And that just portends greater strength in the year, despite some hiccups that we typically have in the months of September and October when we see volatility heading up. So I want to show you what volatility has been doing. This is the VIX, and I'm going to put a six-month chart. And you can see we've launched off of this support level down here. That's in the 13s. And we are right Right back up at where we have peaked before. So this doesn't mean that stocks can't go lower if the VIX stays where it is, but probably seen uh, a little bit of a, a less steep decline. Um, and if the VIX does spike higher to, let's say, 21 or 22, some of these higher points that we've seen earlier in the year, then we would expect more downside from there. Uh, but I just want to close. When we're talking about seasonality, we can look at the S&P 500 or the Russell 2000. I'm looking at the VIX right now, and we are in the midst of the worst two-week period for the VIX. That is higher VIX means more fear in the market, hence worse. This ends in uh, the first week of October. So until then, Rochelle, I think things could be a little bit dicey. But again, we have all this strength from the beginning of the year that tends to portend strength towards the end of the year as well. So it could be a light at the end of the tunnel versus perhaps yes. another train coming down the track. I guess we'll have to see. Appreciate you as always. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery. Thanks so much. The Silicon Valley has long been known as the tech paradise and has had regional dominance for business for several years now, housing some of the biggest companies in the U.S., Apple, Google, Meta, of course, just to name a few. Ever since the pandemic, layoffs, state policies, real estate prices, they've hit California, and the dream has been upset with companies now looking elsewhere to grow their businesses. With that in mind, some cities that have come to mind are Austin, Miami and Boston. But Salt Lake City could also be a contender, according to data from FDI Intelligence. Now, Utah has seen tech jobs and businesses increase, seeing over 67,000 new tech jobs added in its capital city since 2019. It's projected to grow more than 30 percent in the next decade. And the Silicon Slopes have also been highly competitive in attracting unicorns, ranking behind California between 1991 and 2021 when you compare the number of unicorns founded to the size of the state's economy. Well, the holidays are coming up quick. Book travel, booking travel might not be high on your to-do list, but it should be. According to Hopper's 2023 holiday travel outlook, you should be booking no later than October 14th to get the best prices. For more on this year's holiday travel, Haley Berg, Hopper lead economist, joins me now. Good to see you, Haley. This always gives me a little bit of anxiety here because I'm like, we're coming into October. I have not planned anything at all. What should people really think about when planning for their, for their holiday travel for Thanksgiving first and then Christmas? 
Well, you're not alone. Most travelers have not booked their holiday trips yet, whether it be flights, renting their cars or hotels. So you're not alone, but it is time to start planning. Prices for airfare will be the lowest between now and October 14th. So the next three or so weeks after that, they're definitely going to skyrocket, especially with the threat of higher jet fuel prices in the second half of this year. Travelers really need to get ahead, book in advance to make sure they're getting the best prices so that those travel budgets can go a little bit further in a time where we know many families' budgets are feeling tight. And so, Haley, walk us through where we are in terms of average airfare prices domestically first to start versus where we were last year. For Thanksgiving, fares are looking really good. Right now, average domestic fares for Thanksgiving are around $268 per ticket. That's down from last year and down from 2019. So a better deal than you would have gotten in the last couple of years. For Christmas, prices are around $400, notoriously a much more expensive holiday to travel. And those prices are down about 12% from last year, but remain significantly higher than 2019, almost 30% higher than what you would have paid for holiday travel in 2019 in December. So that is why it's so important to book at the right time, because though prices have improved from last year, for Christmas in particular, you are still paying much more than you would have paid five years ago. And Haley, I know at one point this year when people are looking, it ended up being cheaper to try and travel internationally. Is that still the case? And where are the deals to be had if you do decide to fly internationally? There are deals available internationally at the holidays for Thanksgiving, for example, heading to the Caribbean or even to Australia, New Zealand, that region of the world can be less expensive than last year and 2019. The most important part you have to keep in mind is when you travel matters. You can get incredible deals for both holidays if you travel on those off-peak dates that no one else is gonna be traveling on. So for Thanksgiving, don't plan a trip that leaves the Friday before Thanksgiving and comes back the Sunday after. You'll pay hundreds more than you need to. Just shift your date so you return on the Monday after Thanksgiving or fly just two days before Thanksgiving to get the best prices. So deals are out there, but you need to be smart about when you book and the dates you travel on. And I was looking at some of your most popular destinations for Thanksgiving. So New York for domestic flights, London, interestingly, um, as well for, for international flights. And I don't know if that's because, is it about traveling to countries that don't celebrate Thanksgiving? Or, or how do you end up getting the better deal then internationally when it comes to Thanksgiving flights? Oftentimes, Thanksgiving is a time of year where travelers head home for the holidays. They're not thinking about international trips. And that means demand can be a little bit slower and you can find really great deals. Typically at Thanksgiving, we most workers will have at least Thanksgiving day off. Some have Black Friday off. So you're able to make a really long weekend out of the Thanksgiving holiday. And that's when we see a lot of travelers trying to do shorter haul international trips, maybe a five day trip to Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, London, just a four or five hour flight from the East Coast of the U.S. is another great option. An international trip is a little bit cheaper than you would have paid during the summer. And you can sneak it in over that slightly longer weekend. Now, even though we're seeing airfares coming down, I mean, timing couldn't be worse. You have people's student loan payments, you know, coming back in, inflation still high. For people who are trying to find something on a budget, perhaps renting a car, going somewhere local, what is the best way to get a deal if you're really on a budget and you, and you really can't travel internationally? Staycations are one of my biggest recommendations for deal seekers. Oftentimes, when we think about a fabulous vacation, we think about heading to Europe, going on a really big trip. But oftentimes, a luxury or a, a really incredible experience is right in our hometown. Typically, over the holidays, there's an exodus from the cities. Travelers are headed home for the holidays. That can mean that your city hotels might be empty over the holiday weekend. That goes for Christmas as well. So look for hotels, maybe one with an indoor pool if you live in a cold weather, weather location that are available the weekend of your holiday and call. Ask if they have what's called a geofenced rate or a rate for locals. You can often get a better deal than anyone else just by staying in a hotel that is in your city, even in your state. So you can get great staycation 
amazing deals, but also think about road trips. You know, rental car prices today for Thanksgiving are averaging just about $42 a day. So even with slightly higher fuel costs on the highway, you may be able to get to a destination a few hours away for less than booking a couple domestic flights for a family. Well, that, that gives us some hope and something for everybody, at least. Appreciate you joining us. Haley Berg, Hopper Lead Economist. Thank you so much. Great being with you. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. You have tons of great economic analysis, markets analysis as well, but you're also training for the New York Marathon. <laughs> what is your number one tip for all the runners out there that are perhaps trying to get their miles in and see you when they're running throughout the five boroughs here in New York later? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, you, you have to be really determined to do it. You know, do not give up because as much as it can be very painful and exhausting, you know, when you get through that, you feel great. So just keep going and keep training with consistency. You know, you, you can't slack off, so to speak. <laughs> you got to do it every other day, I would say, or every two days and really put in the work. You'll, you'll make it. A government shutdown could force FEMA to stop all disaster aid during the peak of hurricane season. With that in mind, the government agency is already nearly stretched to its limit. FEMA restricted its spending back in August to only address life-threatening emergencies. The restriction means thousands of projects to rebuild facilities and infrastructure after disasters, typically funded in large part by FEMA, have been put on hold. Joining us now is Craig Fugate, former FEMA administrator. I appreciate you joining me this morning. So... When you talk about where the funding shortfall already was, what does the threat of a looming government shutdown add in terms of the increased pressure on FEMA's responsibility? Well, the biggest problem for FEMA will be all of the uh, permanent workforce, about 5,000 employees, um, will be put at risk in a, what they call lapse of funding if the government shuts down. So while disaster work can continue, because those funds don't end at the end of the fiscal year, but they're running out, all of the permanent workforce 
uh, they have to go and, and do what we call, you know, each person, each position, what's going to be considered essential and what's got to go, you know, people that will have to go home and stop work. That could be, you know, the 5,000 workforce, that could be, you know, 90% of the folks are at home, uh, not working their jobs and not supporting the disaster response teams. And so then when it comes to actually responding to disasters, as we're, we're in the peak of, you know, hurricane season, a lot of extreme weather continuing, what sort of, how do you see that affecting the response that FEMA's, that FEMA's able to give in the, in the event of some of these disasters? Well, I'll give an example. During one of the government short shutdowns during the Obama administration, uh, we had a tropical system form and we had to start calling staff back into FEMA headquarter in Washington, D.C. And many of these folks had been furloughed. Uh, they were... Uh, not required to stay there. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get hold of them and have them come in. And they were continuing to do that while not being paid. So then, in terms of the most pressing needs then, in order to be able to have FEMA still respond to these disasters, what are the key priorities that need to be funded for FEMA? Well, the big one is the disaster relief fund, and that's the fund that FEMA has already restricted permanent work until they either get a continuing resolution, which will put money back into it, or a separate supplemental. Uh, you know, this is the thing that with the continuing resolution, uh, it would replenish not only FEMA's operational budget, the base budget of the people that are permanent workforce, it would also put money back into the disaster relief fund. And that should allow FEMA to go back to allowing permanent work to go forward. As it is, those funds are still going down they still are able to respond to immediate needs. And that will not end with a lapse of funding. Those dollars are not a annual appropriation. So they can continue to do that work uh, starting October 1st. But the rest of the FEMA workforce, uh, up to 90% of them potentially could be sent home. And many of those permanent workforce are the people behind the scenes making sure the disaster team and those funds and all the resources they need are, are, are being met. So then when that happens, as you mentioned with the, with the previous uh, government shutdown then, who does the burden then fall on if, if FEMA isn't able to respond? How does that responsibility then get shared amongst other first responders? Well, what happens is it goes back to uh, the state and local governments and a very limited federal program of assistance in a lapse of funding. So when you shut down government, uh, you're shutting down not only disaster response, you're shutting down all the training programs, you're shutting down all the educational programs, and all the support that FEMA provides to state and local governments uh, that's not tied to immediate disaster will be shut down. Plus all of the work on all of the existing disasters, the permanent work, the rebuilding, the rebuilding that's taking place from the hurricanes that hit Florida, rebuilding from the Maui wildfires, all of that is still put on hold until they either get continuing resolution and funding back or separate supplemental. And I think the average person at home probably is, isn't aware of just how much this, this can be affecting people. So then in terms of if you're able to have the ear of lawmakers, what would you want them to know in this moment, considering the sort of hurricane season that we're in? You've got one constitutional duty, and that is to appropriate funds for the federal government to execute their mission. And so if they're not able to do that, where does, the, where does that leave people? How should they perhaps, if not pressure their local leaders, what sort of, what sort of thing can people actually at home do if, if their lawmakers aren't doing these things? Well, whether we have funding or not, it's still important that people have their own preparedness plans, know what they're going to do uh, if a disaster happens. Uh, even with the federal government supporting state and local governments, it's not uncommon that in these big disasters, people need to be prepared for several days of disruptions to infrastructure, roads, and assistance. And so personal preparedness is key year round, uh, but you, you don't wanna be in a situation where you need somebody else to come uh, to you in the first day, unless you're injured or need immediate assistance, uh, because the teams are already under tremendous pressure with these reoccurring disasters. Uh, so personal preparedness is, is, is good, whether we have funding or not, uh, but again, I, I, I continue to implore that Congress needs to understand uh, these disruptions are not just a couple of days, even if they only go a weekend without funding. It causes a ripple effect. Think about all the people in Washington, D.C. right now that are not doing their normal jobs, 
but are preparing for a shutdown of government and continuing those essential operations, knowing that they will not be paid during that period. Certainly bracing for the worst, hoping for the best. But as we've seen there, not, not a lot of breakthrough at the moment. Appreciate you very much for joining us this morning. Craig Fugate, former FEMA administrator. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. If there was one streaming service that you had to cut, what would it be? Oh, I have to admit, I've been a little annoyed with Max. Mm. It's so hard. Like... Every time I, I want to download stuff, it's so limited. It, I find it challenging. Have you finished everything that you wanted to watch on there? And, and now you're just kind of like, all right, I'm good to go here. Yeah, I mean, I took a trip to Hawaii for a work trip. And I was on the plane so long, I needed more. Mm -hmm. And I have to share it with my husband. So that, that makes it challenging, <laughs> you know, because like, he wants to download a lot too. So Certainly. Yeah. Cisco closed its biggest ever deal last week, buying Splunk for $28 billion. The acquisition creates one of the world's largest software companies and boosts Cisco's mission to access more recurring revenue. It's also clearly an AI play. The businesses said artificial intelligence was central to the transaction. A new note from Jeffrey says the deal could be a boon for more than just these two companies. Joining us now is Yahoo Finance's Ali Garfinkel. Ali, good to see you. So break this down for us. Good morning, Rochelle. One thing that's important to know here right off the bat is this deal could absolutely provide a surge in tech M&A, and it would be very welcome. We're coming off of years of this sort of macroeconomic-induced chill across deal-making in tech, a sector that's really been famous for that. And there are two reasons the Cisco Splunk deal could really start moving things forward, I think. The first is that the world of buyers and software is actually doing really well on the public market. 2022 was really difficult. But this year, across software, on average, valuations are up about 13% year to date. That means more optimism, more capital, more freedom to be looking for the kind of inorganic growth that a deal entails. 
Now, the second thing to consider here is the AI hype cycle itself. Yes, we've talked about it a thousand times. But in the context of deal making, you can't really overstate how important this kind of boon really is. Think about it, right? Deals are narrative combined with data. An AI boom, the one we're in right now, is about you know narrative combined with data. So there's this sort of convergence between these two things. And if you really believe that AI is going to kick off this investment cycle, you're also going to be wanting to do all sorts of deals to really meet that moment. So Ali, how much can we really expect here? It's a good question, Rochelle. I think you have to have somewhat tempered expectations. Remember, this deal, the Splunk deal, at almost $30 billion is a mega deal. It is huge. It is hard to get done. And there are only so many of those out there. That said, we are also coming off a really serious slowdown here. Global M&A in the first half of 2023 was down 38%. That's according to Refinitiv data comparing this to the same period in 2022. And remember, the Cisco deal in some ways is unique. Right, Cisco has been especially exquisitive. They've also done one of the other big deals we've seen this year, Armor Block. And I, I don't know if there's going to be a huge wave of deals exactly. I think we could definitely see some movement in the single digit billions, but it sounds like a pretty tall order to be getting movement going in the tens of billions at kind of the scale that I think a lot of people would like to see and would be excited about. Everyone waiting to see what a lift or boat say. We'll have to certainly see if this could be the one that does it. Big thank you to our very own Ali Garfinkel. All right, well, let's get you a final check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. Still looking at a mixed picture, although all three major indices currently near their morning session highs. The Dow there still though just slightly under pressure there, but relatively flat, down about 17 points. The S&P 500 there also up about 0.2%. They're just slightly in the green, they're about nine points. And the tech heavy Nasdaq, they're also up about a third of a percent this morning. We're about 34 points in this final week of September. All right, well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Kufo, but I'll be back with you at 11 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. Stay with us on Yahoo Finance.